Hello, everyone. Nice to see you on my channel, Touching Stories. Today you will hear an amazing story that is based on real events. It's a drama that will be a very important lesson for everyone. Diana was unbearably bored. All day long, she had to devote herself only to her two-year-old daughter. Was that what she was aiming for when she was so diligently wooing the rich and promising John? Diana had succeeded. She married him. But it wasn't how she'd envisioned a wealthy family life. In Diana's dreams, it looked different. She imagined how Mary will travel abroad, dine only in expensive restaurants, visit beauty salons, and lying by the pool, sipping cocktails. In reality, it didn't work out that way. John worked all day, and yes, she was not mistaken. He was a very promising young man. He had recently purchased a large two-story cottage in an elite area of the city. However, the repair was not yet finished, and even now on the second floor of the incessant drilling, knocking workers, talking in an incomprehensible language. Immediately after the wedding, John insisted on having a child, which Diana was not ready for. She has long tried to persuade her husband to live for himself, but the man was adamant. At the time of the wedding, he was 30 years old, and he was ready for fatherhood. But Diana was only 22, and she wanted to flutter and enjoy life. It didn't work out. A year later, Alice was born and Diane had to immerse herself in endless diapers, diapers and formula. Sleepless nights and baby sores drove the girl crazy. John, on principle, did not hire a nanny to help Michael. He turned out to be a good husband, caring and generous, but at the same time, too authoritarian. The man had his own principles and he never deviated from them. One of these principles was that he believed that the young wife should watch over her daughter only herself. My mom raised me without any nannies. That's why we had such a close bond until the day she died. And you'll be fine. So tell me, what else do you have to do? We hired an au pair. No cooking, no cleaning. Just devote yourself to your daughter dying. That's easy to say, devote yourself. Every day is Groundhog Day. Diana hated even going to the park, where there was a big playground. That's where all the rich moms in the neighborhood usually gathered. At first, Diana was happy to get to know them all, hoping to socialize with them. But socializing with them was just talking about the kids. Diana was sick of it. If it were up to her, she wouldn't shove her nose on the playground. But John insisted on daily walks, saying the baby needed fresh air. Of course he needed fresh air, Diana grumbled, gathering her daughter for a walk. Then he would walk by himself, among these clutches. Happy Alice grabbed her sandbox set and a ball. The girl did not fit all this in her hands and she, frowning her eyebrows, looked at her mother. Alice, let's take one thing, either a ball or a set. The girl hardly spoke yet, but she was good at the word no. Diana sighed unhappily, took the ball in her hands and went to the exit of the cottage. On the one hand, getting out into the fresh air now was better than being among the endless sounds of the renovation. Diana and her daughter had just left the gate when a tin car pulled up sharply beside them. Diana's excited friend Anna jumped out of it. Diana, hi. It's so great that I managed to catch you. Look, with what guys I met, Anna led her eyes in the direction of the car, from the windows of which two handsome guys were smiling. We're going to the beach now. Come with us. Diana was horrified. John would kill me if he found out. How would he find out? You'll be home before he gets home. If anything, you can tell him you got held up walking your daughter in the park. Alice won't give us away, will she? Anna winked at the little girl, knowing she wasn't talking yet. Diana hesitated. On the one hand, she really wanted to have fun with these cute guys. But on the other hand, she was afraid that her husband might find out. The girl was silent, thinking, and Anna hurried her. Diana, let's go. Don't let me down. I said I'd be with a friend. The guys are shopping for the picnic. They got champagne for you and me. I don't know what to think. Just get in the car. Okay. Diana's making up her mind. Is it okay that I'm with child? I told the guys you're a young mom. It's okay. Alice can play on the beach. What difference does it make to her where she builds her dollies? Diana nodded and taking her daughter in her arms went to the tent. She sat on the back seat, met the guys and asked them to stop by the store on the way to buy juice and cookies for her daughter. The girl needed something to do too. The guys drove to a remote beach where Diana had never been before. Wow, she exclaimed, 
getting out of the car and lowering her daughter onto the sandy beach. What is Steve Shore here? Yes, nodded one of the guys. It's pretty dangerous in this place. I'll tell you more. There's a whirlpool under that steep shore. You can get sucked in in no time. We won't swim there. We'll swim here, where there's a gentle slope. At least it's less crowded. Imagine how crowded the city beaches are now. There's nowhere to spit. Diana agreed with that. Going to a crowded beach in the company of guys, a married girl does not need to. And here, in fact, it was not crowded. Apart from their company, there was only a young married couple with a boy of about five years old. The wife was in an old faded swimsuit, long out of fashion, and the couple had nothing on the bedspread except a water bottle. How did they get here? Anna asked in a whisper. I don't see a car. They probably came on foot, grinned one of the guys, taking bags of food and drinks out of the trunk. All right, let's get away from them and start getting settled. Girls, there's a blanket over there. Lay it down. In half an hour, the merry company, which had time to swim, was laughing. The guys, despite the fact that one of them was driving, drank strong alcohol, and Diana and Anna sipped champagne coquettishly. Diana didn't regret in the slightest that she had agreed to this trip. It had been fun with the guys. And Alice, apparently, was not bored. The beach was sandy and the girl did her favorite thing. Armed with a set for the sandbox, little girl diligently tried to mold figures. Bacham, a little shy, a boy approached her, the son of the vacationers in the neighborhood. Alice smiled and handed him her trowel. When the boy took it, the girl ran to her mom and pointed to the juice box. Diana stuck a tube in it and handed the juice to her daughter. Alice went back to her new friend and generously handed him the juice, but then the mom pulled the girl back. Alice, don't let the boy drink from your tube. You can't do that. What if he's sick? The boy's parents heard this shout and looked at each other. I should have bought Michael some lemonade, the young woman sighed. The man nodded sullenly at her. Georgia shivered slightly under the appraising glances of the girls in the neighboring company. Her husband jumped up from his seat and took Michael by the hand and walked toward the river. He offered to take a swim, but she didn't feel like it. She felt uncomfortable when the girl forbade her daughter to share her juice with Georgia's son. And they only had a bottle of water with them. It's understandable, the family was desperately short of money. Georgia and her husband Steve had recently bought a one-room apartment and had gotten into huge debts. To pay off these debts, Steve worked like a curse, grabbed any part-time job, and when he was offered a callum on the replacement of the roof in one of the houses of the private sector, the young man happily grabbed it. Of course, safety in such places was completely absent, and Steve did not hold on to the roof and collapsed suffering injuries. It took him several months to recover and he was unable to work during that time. George's nurse's salary was barely enough to pay the rent and buy a rudimentary set of groceries, and the family still had to pay for kindergarten, buy him clothes and wanted to treat the child sometimes, which unfortunately happened less and less often. Steve didn't work, debts were piling up, but Georgia didn't despair. Nothing. Steve is a very hard-working man and is almost well. Pretty soon, he'll be back to work and the family will be back on their feet, paying off their debts. Today, Georgia had a rare day off and she wanted to get away with her beloved family. They'd chosen this normally deserted beach to get away from people. It didn't matter that it was a 40-minute walk to the beach. As luck would have it, this rowdy bunch of guys rolled in and ruined Georgia's mood. She knew one of the guys visually. He'd gone to the same school as her and lived not far from her parents. The rest of the merrymakers were unfamiliar to Georgia. The girl immediately noticed the arrogant, appraising look the girl's mom gave her and she felt a little ashamed of her old swimsuit. Well, so be it. Immediately restrained Georgia. Let me wear a swimsuit of a hundred years ago, but next to my beloved husband and son. I'm happy with them and someday we'll have everything. The company was walking very cheerfully, noisily splashing in the river, loudly clinking, laughing. The little girl was left to herself, and it was evident that she was very glad when Michael joined her in her games. But then the girl's mother shouted at her and Georgia realized that the rest was ruined. Steve, I'm tired. Why don't we go home? She said quietly to her husband. The man looked at her shrewdly. He understood his wife with half a word. Well, let's have one last rinse. Are you coming? 
Georgia shook her head in the negative and Steve, shouting to the sun, went with him to the river. After a while Diana, who was already quite tipsy, noticed that the couple resting in the neighborhood began to gather. Oh, at last, she wrinkled her pretty nose. Finally, they are leaving. I do not like that my Alice with this boy plays. They are like that. What are they like? Asked Diana one of the guys with whom she was having fun. I know this girl. I went to school with her. She's all right. And her husband seems to be quite normal. Diana shrugged uncertainly and turned away from the couple. Let's have a drink, she said cheerfully and grabbed a shot glass with strong alcohol as they had long since finished the champagne with Anna. The girl Alice stood on the sand and sadly watched her new acquaintance, a boy Michael, taken away from the beach by his mom and dad. The girl kicked the ball with all her might and it rolled down the beach and rolled down a steep cliff. Alice ran after the ball. The girl ran up to the cliff. The ball was not visible. Alice carelessly hung down, trying to see it in the water. Through the loud laughter, no one but Anna heard a slight shriek and a splash of water. Anna looked around and didn't immediately realize that something was wrong. When she did, she shouted loudly, Diana, where's Alice? Where is your daughter? Diana looked around with a dazed look. Where is she? Where did she go? She didn't run away. She fell in the water. I heard a splash. As if on cue, the whole group jumped to their feet and ran to the steep bank. There were circles in the water, and in the center of those circles Alice's ball floated orphaned. Diana abruptly began to sober up and was thrown into hysterics. Alice, daughter, I can't swim, somebody jump in. Save my daughter, the girl threw herself on the guy's chests. But her new acquaintances stood there with their eyes down. They had warned in advance about the whirlpool in this place and they didn't want to drown because of a girl they didn't know and her child. Diana howled and tried to push the boys to the shore to save Alice, but they froze in place. And then, past the standing guys and the girl struggling between them, a male figure flashed by lightning and dived into the water. Steve, what are you doing? There was a shout behind them. It was Georgia, literally dragging her son by the hand. She and her husband hadn't gotten far before they heard Diana howling. Steve instantly realized what was going on and reacted with lightning speed. Georgia and Michael ran to the shore and now, along with the others, kept their eyes on the water closing over Steve. The time dragged on for an agonizingly long time. It was only a few seconds, but it seemed an eternity to those standing on the shore. It was little Michael who was the first to fall. The boy roared loudly and began to call for his father. Then Georgia screamed. Panic grew. The girl's head appeared on the surface of the water with her eyes closed. Steve came up next, struggling to breathe and trying to push the little girl out of the maelstrom. It was obvious that the man was exhausted. The boys on the shore fussed. They scrambled down and getting as far into the water as they could, held out their hands to the girl. Steve pushed the little girl toward them as hard as he could and disappeared under the water in the same second. Diana ran around the shore around her pale daughter, who was being given CPR by Anna, and ignored the wailing Georgia, whose husband had not come out of the water. Alice coughed and opened her eyes. Diana exhaled, grabbed her daughter in her arms, held her tightly against her. The girl cried. Only then did Diana look at Georgia running along the shore and almost tearing her hair out. What about her husband? One of the boys shook his head mournfully, lowering his eyes. That was it. He didn't swim out. I guess his strength's gone. Should we call whoever we're supposed to call in these cases? Police? Divers? How do we call them? Diana was confused. Then everyone will know. Find out what? The guy didn't understand. That we were here. My husband will know. No, I can't let that happen. You call whoever you want. I'm calling a cab and I'm leaving. Diana, what are you doing? That man drowned to save your daughter, and he saved her, a dazed Anna exclaimed. And I'm grateful to him for that. Diana cut him off, but my husband mustn't know anything about it. The bewildered Georgia floundered on the shore. The girl hardly realized what was happening and did not notice the moment when the cab left the beach with her daughter. It still seemed to Georgia that Steve was about to surface and she ran, keeping her eyes on the water. 
When the police arrived, she begged them to get her husband out and Michael roared loudly as he sat on the sand. At some point, Georgia came to her senses, walked over to her son and slumped down beside him and put her arm around his shoulders. Don't cry, son. Daddy will be all right. He must have surfaced somewhere else. The girl herself believed what she was telling her son. How could it be any other way? She couldn't think of any other outcome. They can't be without Steve. They just can't. And he can't just leave them alone. After a while, the policeman began to insist that Georgia should go home and the search should continue here without her. The girl shook her head stubbornly, sitting on the sand and hugging her son. She began to sway, as if in a trance from side to side. One of the policemen, wanting to bring the girl to her senses, said to her rather rudely, Stop thinking about yourself and think about your child. Look at your son. Why should he see all this? These words sobered Georgia a little and she looked at Michael. The boy couldn't cry anymore. He whimpered like a frightened kitten, clinging to his mother's side and staring at the river with swollen slits in his eyes. Yes, Michael, come on. I'll take you to Grandma's. Then I'll be back. She turned to the policeman, back as soon as I take the baby to his mom. Steve wasn't found until the third day, when his body floated to the surface. Diane was waiting for her husband to come home from work. In the last few days, she had been such a good wife, just a goody-goody. In fact, the girl was very scared. Every day, she called her friend Anna and found out how the search for the man who had saved her daughter was progressing. Strictly Nastrigo Diana had instructed Anna to keep silent about their presence on the beach. Although, of course, both the police and the lifeguards were aware that the man they were looking for was a hero who had saved a child at the cost of his own life. But the mother of this child did not want publicity and left before the police arrived on the scene. Well, that's her right. No one could force gratitude. Still, Diana was shaking. Every day, when her husband returned from work, the first thing she did was to look anxiously into his face to see if he had found out anything. The girl realized that she was guilty on all sides. She went to the beach with strange guys, drank with them and poorly washed her daughter. Yes, what a sin to say, Diana at that moment was a lot of fun and at times she even forgot that Alice was playing nearby. But then again, even in those thoughts, Diana managed to blame her husband. It was his own fault. Locked her here in four walls with a child, no rest, no respite. So she went off the rails. Obviously, John wouldn't accept that excuse. What would he do if he knew the truth? Divorced her the same day, at the very least. Diana was sure of that, knowing well the resolute temper of her husband. He'd also be able to sue for his daughter on the basis of what had happened. Diana shuddered at the thought. Don't think about bad things. Everything will be fine. Anna would keep quiet, it was her fault, and the boys knew nothing about Diana. Through the window opened on the first floor, Diana heard her husband's car drive into the yard. The girl put on a smile, fixed a beautiful bow on her daughter's head and ran to meet her husband. Oh, John, you're earlier than usual today. Alice and I missed you. Haven't we, Alice? John smiled dutifully at Michael, absorbed in his own thoughts, and at dinner he was quite distracted nodding occasionally at Diana's incessant chatter. John, what are you always thinking about? My wife couldn't stand it. Do you even listen to what I'm telling you? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just thinking. I heard a story today. A man drowned in our town four days ago. They pulled him out yesterday. No, I haven't heard Diana's tense. Well, drowned and drowned, it happens. Why do you care so much? It's just the details. The man rushed to save someone else's child, a girl, I think. He managed to save her, pushed her to the surface, but he ran out of strength and drowned. Can you imagine? Well done, what can I say, Diana shrugged. He's not just a good man, John said indignantly. The man is a hero. I keep thinking, yes, many people would give their lives for their own child. John looked at Alice, but for someone else's. Let's say, would I be able to throw myself into the maelstrom for someone else's child like him? I don't know. I'm not sure. It's a very dangerous place and everyone knows it. That man knew it too and he deliberately took the risk for someone else's girl. I admire people like that. Diana sat there, dead or alive. How unpleasant this conversation was for her. She really wanted to change the subject, 
but John wouldn't let her. No, but you know what the best part is. The mom of the rescue girl took her daughter and left the shore right after the man drowned. She didn't wait for the rescuers, nor did she express her gratitude to this Michael, who was also there by the way. Nothing. Nobody knows who she is. The only rumor is that she was drunk and didn't take care of her child. It was entirely her fault that the girl fell into the river. So drunk, Diana muttered angrily, I don't know how life happens. John, we don't know all the details. Let's not judge anyone. I am. John said defiantly, I do judge a mother like that. She goes to the river with a little kid and drinks there. She's probably from a dysfunctional background and unmarried. A normal woman wouldn't act like that. And that man had a family, a small son. They say they were already poor. And now they were left without a breadwinner. And for whom, you ask yourself? Some naughty mom. The more her husband got angry, the colder Diana got. It's even worse than she thought. I can't imagine what her husband would do if he found out she was his wife. John, what if you and I were to take a trip somewhere? Diana blurted out. No, but seriously, you and I had a lot of fun. We didn't go on a wedding trip. Then Alice was born. Let's go on vacation. Okay, let's try it. John suddenly agreed. Tomorrow I'll go to work and try to solve the most important issues. Maybe we'll go to the sea, if only for a while. The next day Diana was not herself. She couldn't wait for John to come home from work, and her anxiety was growing. She wanted to get out of town before this story died down. Her husband had gotten a little too emotional about the so-called hero's behavior. Diane called her husband to see if he had been able to settle the important issues and if the trip would take place. When John reassured her, Diana happily rushed to the second floor to pack her things. Just then, the all pair called out to her, Diana, there's a girl at the gate asking for you. What girl? Diana was surprised. It was Sveka again. She jumped out and with a quick step, reached the gate and opened it. All the blood drained from Diana's face when she saw who stood before her. It was Georgia, the drowned man's wife. How did you find me? Diana hissed at Georgia, closing the gate tightly behind her. One of the guys you were on the beach with told me the address. He and I went to the same school. Georgia answered in a weak, quiet voice. She was staggering and dark circles under her eyes. She couldn't remember the last time she'd eaten or if she'd eaten at all since her husband's death. But Diana didn't care about the appearance of this grief-stricken girl. She was only angry. Angry that Georgia had come to her house. What do you want? Why did you come here? She asked her rudely. Georgia didn't seem to notice the aggression directed at her and continued to talk quietly. You know, Steve was just found yesterday. His body. Now it's a funeral. And I don't have any money to bury him. We don't have any money. Not me. Not my mom. There's no one to turn to. We already owe everyone. Steve didn't work for a while. He was sick. What's it got to do with me? Why did you come to me? It was only now that Georgia began to realize how rude Diana was being to her. She looked up, scrutinizing her face. I thought maybe you could help me with money. I'll give it back. Not right away. But I'll give it back. Oh, that's it. You've come to beg for money. You think because your husband died for my daughter, I owe you money? Did I ask him to do that? It was only his decision. He couldn't assess his own strength. Couldn't get out. Whose fault is that? All right, well, just stay here. I'll be right back. Diana ran into the house and Georgia stood puzzled. This was not the reaction she'd expected from the rescue girl's mom. I'll not this. Georgia knew that if someone had saved Michael, she would have given that person everything she had and been grateful to the end of her life. And all she'd come to Diana for was a loan. While Georgia was pondering, Diana jumped out of the gate and shoved a couple of crumpled bills into the girl's sweaty palm. Here, take these. I won't give you any more, and don't come here. You hear me? You don't have to give anything back, but don't ever show your face here again. And don't you dare implicate me in your husband's death. He took a dive, he drowned. Nobody pushed him into the river. Georgia stared into Diana's face with wide open eyes. She didn't even look at the denomination of the bills now clutched in her hand, but raised her hand and threw them at Diana's face with fury. Choke on your hand out. I don't know what my husband would have done knowing what you were like. He probably would have died for the girl anyway. That was Steve's thing. But except that I, if it were possible to rewind time, 
would never have let him jump in the river. I have hung a rock around his neck and held him down, wouldn't have let him. Georgia turned and walked away from the gate, and Diana picked up the bills from the ground and ran into the house, looking around cautiously to see if anyone had seen the scene. A couple days later, Steve's funeral was held. There were a lot of people there, and they were mostly strangers who didn't care. Many people in town had heard how the young man had died, and contrary to George's expectations, the funeral was decent. People who learned about the difficult material Paula McClaya of the hero's family began to bring his wife money. They brought free of charge, who can bring as much as they can, from the world by the thread, as they say. The largest sum was brought to the girl from a businessman who wished to remain anonymous. The girl could not believe how many people around her cared and was immensely grateful to them. But the loss of her husband was very hard for her. For the first year, the girl lived as if in a trance, floating along the stream, not noticing anything and no one around except for her son. Money was constantly lacking, debts had not gone anywhere, and despite Steve's death, they had to be paid. Georgia worked 24 hours a day, taking a nursing job. She pulled the strain forgetting about herself and seeing the child only at night, but at the same time trying to make sure that he had everything he needed. Michael went to school, and despite the fact that his mother never had time to do his homework with him, he studied very well. The boy became independent early. Being with him in public Georgia often caught envious glances of her son in the direction of children proudly walking with their dads. When Michael was nine years old, a patient with an attack of appendicitis was admitted to the hospital where Georgia worked. This man was much older than Georgia, but nevertheless immediately began to give signs of attention to the young nurse. At first the girl only waved away from such an intrusive bow, but then she thought. And why not? The man seems to be not bad, divorced. According to him, he's very fond of children, and Michael needs a man's attention. Georgia made up her mind and tried to introduce the man, whose name was Dustin, to her son. She was very nervous bringing a man into the house for the first time. Contrary to her fears, Michael took to Dustin calmly and even joyfully. The boy told his new acquaintance passionately about his schoolwork, and he listened attentively, shaking his head respectfully. Georgia exhaled with relief. So that's the way it's going to be. Michael would need a father. And she could stop working around the clock and spend more time with her son. It's so wonderful to have a strong male shoulder to lean on. In three months, Georgia and happy Michael moved into Dustin's apartment. It was a rather spacious two-bedroom apartment in which the boy finally had his own room. Dustin was very kind and attentive, but only for the time being. As time went on, Georgia began to notice that the child was annoying her new man. Michael was so attracted to him and was ready to call him daddy, but apparently his stepfather didn't want him to. Call me Uncle Dustin. I'm not your daddy. You're not a little boy. You understand everything. Dustin snapped at the boy, and Michael shrank back. Everything seemed to be the same, except that now Michael didn't run to his stepfather to brag about his success in school and tell him about his affairs. Dustin seemed to enjoy it. Over time, Georgia began to realize that this man needs more of a mistress in the house, who will cook, clean, and the child was in his way. And one day, far from being a beautiful day, Georgia returned from her shift and from the doorstep heard her son crying. The woman rushed into the room and saw Michael standing in the corner. His legs were covered in red stripes and his belt was lying next to him. Dustin, smirking smugly, sat in a chair. Oh, you're here? Listen to what your son has done. Georgia didn't want to hear anything. The blood rushed to her head. The woman grabbed the belt that was lying on the floor and threw herself at the man, trying to whip him as hard as she could. She failed, of course. A small, angry woman jumping with a belt in her hands near a tall man looked silly. Not expecting such a violent reaction, Dustin intercepted Georgia's arm. What are you so mad about? He's a boy, and boys are supposed to be raised. It wasn't a big deal. I whipped his ass. My father used to whip my ass like that when I was a kid. That's why I grew up to be a man. Georgia cried. She threw the belt away and ran to her son, who was still roaring in the corner. Michael, Michael, come on. We're going back to our apartment right now. You will never see that man again. 
After her failed affair with Dustin, Georgia had stopped looking at men altogether. The young woman had come to believe that strangers could never treat her son as their own, and she didn't want to worry about whether her new husband had hurt Michael. Besides, Georgia hadn't been able to get rid of Dustin for quite some time. After she and Michael had left, he'd initially stopped the woman, begging her to come back, saying he'd made a mistake and would never lay a finger on the child again. But Georgia did not even consider the option of returning. She has a strong aversion to Dustin. It turned out to be not all surprises on the man's part. Once he was convinced that the woman had left him for good, he showed his true vindictive, vindictive nature. Dustin began filing complaints about Georgia to the head doctor as an incompetent medical professional, and he also stalked her co-workers and told them nasty things about the woman. Georgia was shocked by these behaviors, but Dustin didn't accomplish anything with it. Georgia was too well known at work to believe the ravings of an offended man. All of these events only reinforced Georgia's belief that she shouldn't consider men as potential husbands. She should devote herself to Michael, which she did. Georgia got back on her feet and started working around the clock to provide for her son. The woman's life resembled a daily struggle for survival, but her son pleased her as he grew up a boy smart, kind, fair. He's a lot like Steve. Georgia often thought, only is that a good thing? What did my husband's kindness lead to? To leaving us alone for the happiness of another man's family. It was that very family that Georgia saw in all its glory. Early one morning, she was coming back from another part-time job, tired. She had only a few hours to sleep and then back to the hospital. And then a large white car pulled up not far from her. Georgia didn't know much about cars, but even from the look of it, she could tell that it was very expensive. A man got out of the car first, and Georgia didn't pay him any attention until Diana stepped out of the passenger door. Georgia recognized her immediately in a flash. That hateful face seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Why prettier? It was just better groomed. Now seeing Diana, the only expression that came to mind was gorgeous woman. Meanwhile, the man stepped to the back door of the car and having opened it, helped the girl to get out. Alice was wearing a beautiful pink coat and white boots. Georgia's heart skipped a beat and she fixed her gaze on the child's face. It was because of this girl that her beloved husband was not in the world right now. Steve had given his life for her. Now she lit us and he doesn't, and it could have been the other way around. How many times had Georgia replayed in her mind the events of that fateful day? Had they left then, just a few minutes earlier, and things would have gone differently. Steve would be alive and Michael would be growing up with a full family. And the woman herself wouldn't have had to work around the clock to feed her child. Steve. The woman's eyes filled with tears at the memory of him. How much she had loved him. He was probably the only man she could love in her life. Beautiful and happy as they looked, the family disappeared behind the doors of a store and Georgia watched them go. She hated Diana, but worst of all, and she couldn't help it, she seemed to hate the girl too. Her mind knew that the child was innocent, but her heart fluttered at the sight of this pretty little girl whose life her husband had given his own. Diana shrugged her shoulders shakily. She hadn't noticed Georgia, but she could feel the hateful stare directed at her back. Diana was already angry. Today, John had decided to take the day off, and instead of taking her to a restaurant, instead of devoting it to Michael, for example, he'd taken her and his daughter to a children's clothing store. Although Alice's closets are already overflowing with clothes. What's a baby need? She's growing up and some things do not even have time to wear once. And John liked to pamper the girl, dressing her up in expensive things, giving her toys without measure. What else can he do? Grinned Diana. He won't have any other children. At least he's made peace with that. As soon as Alice was a little older, her husband began to insist on having a second child. John wanted a son, he just wanted a son. And Diana was horrified at the suggestion. What child? She only had Alice off her hands. Diana exhaled, being able to take time for herself. And here it was again. The mere thought of sleepless nights with a baby in diapers terrified Diana. No, she didn't want that to happen again. She's not a soul after all, to give birth on demand. She wanted to live and live beautifully. Obviously, if Diana told her husband about it, he would only freak out, so she decided to do the trick here. For a long time, 
the woman pretended that she could not get pregnant, diligently protecting herself secretly from John. Then she got herself a fake checkup. In reality, the woman paid the head doctor of the gynecology clinic for the report she needed and with a sorrowful expression on her face, handed it to her husband. What is this? John asked. I do not understand anything in these medical terms. Explain in Russian what it says here. It says here that I can never be a mother again. You see, I won't be able to get pregnant again. That can't be. The man exclaimed. What kind of diagnosis do you have? Everything can be cured nowadays if you pay well. If necessary, you will be treated abroad. It's not curable. It's not curable, Diana shouted, trying to cry. The woman pretended to be hysterical. What do you think? I didn't recognize it. What do you think it's like for me to get a diagnosis like that? I wanted a baby so badly. What's going to happen now? You're going to leave me? Diana pretended to shake with sobs, covering her face with the palms of her hands, her eyes completely dry. Through the slits in her fingers, she watched her confused husband's reaction. Diana, really? Why would I leave you because you're sick? Don't be silly. But uh, maybe we could try. No, no, Diane shrieked. I've been assured there's no cure. John hugged his wife reassuringly, deciding to return to this conversation a little later, when she had calmed down. He had no reason not to believe Diana, though. Well, what kind of woman would attribute infertility to herself in the middle of nowhere? Diana was, in principle, satisfied with the result of her performance. And when, after a while, John tried to return to this conversation again, again through a tantrum, and that's how she made her husband forget about the second child. And yet, Diana was sure that her husband would never leave her because he loved his only daughter too much. So let him be content with her. And Diana herself has other worries. Her personal life. Diana's light flirtation with a fitness trainer recently turned into a relationship, and she plunged into it with her head. Starting this relationship, Diana was shaking a lot. It was the first time she cheated on her husband. Well, on the other hand, what does John want, disappearing all day at work? Diane is young and beautiful, and men are paying attention to her. Diane was freaking out. Once again, her meeting with her new, young boyfriend had fallen through. John asked her to take Alice to the electronics store and pick out a new smartphone for her birthday. Her daughter's birthday was two weeks ago, though. It's just that Alice wasn't happy with the gift. Here the father and succumbed to the persuasion of the girl decided to give her a smartphone. Girls, Diana grinned. The daughter is already quite an adult bidding guys. Diana should know that. It was John who thought her daughter was still young. And Diana felt her daughter was her competition. Of course she did, because her last lover was only a little older than her daughter. And yet he has no idea how old she really is. Before leaving the house, Diana cast a fleeting glance in the mirror. She looks great. How could one guess her real age here? What a young beauty she is. Diane hurried on seeing that her daughter was already waiting for her in the car with John's driver. That asshole could go off on her own. Although where can she go without money? Mom said Alice when the woman got into the car. Maybe I'll drive myself. I know you have no desire to ride with me. Give me the money, I'll grab my friend and we'll pick out a smartphone with her. The girl squinted slyly. No way, sighed Diana. Dad said to go together, so let's go. In the store, Alice went straight to the most expensive gadgets. We should think. Hum, Diana, we do not consider the cheap ones. This one poked her daughter's finger at the latest model of iPhone. Mom, buy this one, but make sure it's gold colored. Young man, Diana called the sales consultant, please come over. Calling the guy Diana thought to just give him instructions to make a purchase, but when he came closer and the woman saw him, decided to do something else. We want to buy this smartphone. Tell us about its features. The guy spoke and Diana admired how young and handsome he was. No, really very handsome. Wavy black hair arranged in a fashionable hairstyle and the eyes. You only see eyes like that in the movies. They seem to radiate light. Diana used all her tricks and flirted with the salesman, not noticing that her own daughter also keeps her eyes on this guy. The guy, on the other hand, only noticed the girl. He was inexperienced in the games of adult women and saw the girl's admiring gaze at once. Oh, you explain everything so well. It's rare to find such competent salesmen. 
I'll probably become your regular customer, cooed Diana, when the guy made the purchase. We are always happy to see you in our store, smiled the salesman on duty. Walking from the hip, Diana moved to the exit of the store. A disheveled Alice walked beside her. Near the door, she turned around to see the guy she liked once again. Her cheeks flushed when she saw that the salesman was also looking at her. Michael. Alice whispered the name she read on the guy's name day. I'll come here again, Michael. Mother and daughter reached the house in silence, but when they got out of the car, away from the driver's ears, Diana seemed to realize, Oh, daughter, and we forgot to buy you accessories for your phone. Headphones. A case for your new smartphone. All right. I'll go back to the store tomorrow and get it for you. What color case do you want? Don't mom, Alice got angry. You don't have to go anywhere. I'll buy the cover myself. Will you stop fluffing up your old feathers in front of young boys? How are you talking to me? Diana shrieked. What do you mean, old feathers? Where do you see an old lady? Come on, mom, you're not 18 years old anymore and you're still looking at young guys. It's only dad who doesn't notice anything. Of course, in front of him, you behave differently, and I'm already ashamed to bring my friends into the house. As soon as a less handsome guy walks in, you start parading around. You think I don't know where you go when your dad's at work, and how reverently you keep your phone close to you at all times. Stop talking nonsense, Diana shouted, and where do you stick your nose anyway? Are you trying to tell me what to do with the chicken's eggs? I don't want to hear any more talk like that. You won't if you don't go to today's store to wag your tail in front of the salesman. But if you continue to push him around, I'll tell daddy. Or I'll have him catch you in the act. I hate that you're lying to him, but I'm used to keeping quiet. I've been used to it since I was a kid. I don't think you deserve daddy. I just don't want to disturb his peace of mind. I don't want to worry him. Alice shook a little. The first time in her life, she allowed herself to talk to her mother like that, although she had long been seething with indignation seeing her mother's constant cheating. The girl did not listen to Diana's angry answer, but turned around and jumped out into the yard. She took out her cell phone and dialed her friend Alfia. She had recently turned 18 and her parents had given her a brand new car for her birthday. Alfia, hi, are you busy right now? Could you take me somewhere? An hour later, the girls were sitting in the car and looking carefully at the huge glass doors of the electronics store where Alice had recently bought her smartphone. It's still half an hour before the store closes. Alfia grumbled unhappily, looking at the time on the dashboard. What are we going to sit here for so long? Let's go in and look at your handsome boy. No, Alice was afraid. I've only been here recently. He'll know I'm on purpose. Of course he will. But isn't that what you want if you like him so much? How are you going to get to know him? Also, you forgot something. Is it okay that you're dating Oliver? You think he'd be so cool with you telling him you like someone else? Oliver's a complicated guy, and I don't think he'd tolerate that. Why do I have to think about Oliver right now? Who says I'm gonna make it with this guy? Maybe he has a girlfriend. Well, judging by your burning eyes, you'd move any girl, Alfia smirked. Half an hour later, the store employees began to disperse to their homes. In the crowd, Alice almost missed a tall guy who went out in the company of girls' employees of the store. There he is there, Alice shouted sharply, pointing her finger at the windshield. Start the car, Alfia. Let's go after him. Why are we going to chase him? My friend was surprised. Okay, as you say, it's not difficult for me. I can't see him now, of course, but by all appearances, the guy is in demand among the female sex. Look at all those girls chasing him. He walked with his colleagues only to the corner and then saying goodbye ran to the bus stop. The guy didn't notice the car following him. He was thinking about the girl customer he met in the store today. Her mom, of course, is a little strange, but they have the smell of wealth. The kind of smartphone they'd bought would take him several years to save up for. But for them, it must be nothing. Michael sighed. As much as he didn't like the girl, how could a simple salesman like her? Mom, are you home? I'm home. Michael shouted as he entered the apartment. Georgia, who had just returned from her shift, had already prepared a flavorful kernel for her son. My hand, son, she looked out of the kitchen. We'll have dinner now. Mmm, how delicious it smells, squeezed his eyes, sitting down at the table. When do you have time for everything? How many times have I told you, Mom? 
You are so tired. Come from work and rest. I am able to cook dinner myself. I don't mind. Georgia waved her hand. Come on, tell me how was your day? What's new? I met such a girl today. She bought a phone from me yesterday with her mom. And today she came back to get a case for it. We got to talking. You know, she's so, uh, she's cool, you know? I thought a girl like that would never pay attention to me. But she hinted that she'd like to meet me. Tomorrow's my day off and I'm gonna see her. And she has such an unusual name, Alice. I just don't know where I'm supposed to take her. She seems to be from a very wealthy family. And what can I offer her? A movie and a coffee shop? Georgia, who at the mention of the girl's name had an unpleasant prickling in her stomach, nevertheless paid no attention to it. I'll tell you what, son, if a girl really likes you, she'll be glad to go to a cafe with you. But I don't trust them, those rich ones. Why did they need simple laborers like us? And you should pick an easy girl, but that's up to you. Tell me, how are your studies going? When's the next session? Michael had finished 11 grades well and had a great desire to get a higher education, but Georgia could not afford it. They both realized that. Then the guy made an independent decision. Immediately after school, he got a job as a salesman, and after saving up some money, he enrolled in correspondence school. I will pay for my studies myself, he told his mother. I'll work and study by correspondence, it's no big deal. You're already out of your skin to provide for us. Enough already, we will last now. Give up the rate of nurse. Georgia stubbornly refused. The woman felt guilty. All their lives they'd been struggling to make ends meet and no savings and loan. If her son was going to go to college, he wouldn't have anything. She couldn't even pay for his education. The next day, Michael and Alice met in the city. The guy was a little embarrassed, leading the girl to the movies. What else could he offer this spoiled beauty? Alice didn't care. With this guy, she was ready to just walk around the city, holding hands. From one look of his expressive eyes, the girl's head was blown off. For the first time in her life, Alice fell in love like that without a second thought. It seemed that she was ready to follow Michael to the edge of Anna. Relationships were wrapped up rapidly. Alice immediately after school, studying in the 11th grade, through half the city was carried to a familiar store just to see Michael and interchange with him a few words. The first day, she went on a date with Michael. Alice gave her current boyfriend Oliver the rune around. Oliver was a 19-year-old major with a cool car and was totally unprepared for this turn of events. To be turned down? How could she? Usually girls chase after him and he dumps them after he's played with them. Oliver's wounded ego was at play. Alice's friend Althea was silent as a partisan and did not want to explain to him the reason for such a sharp break in relations. Then Oliver himself decided to track down his ex-girlfriend. It was not difficult at all. Oliver only had to drive up to the school and there she was Alice, rushing to the bus stop and driving in the opposite direction from her house. When Oliver realized the reason for the breakup was another guy, he was furious. How could Alice dump him for some salesman? The guy was a sucker and Oliver's sneakers alone were worth more than all the clothes on that salesman and probably more than all the things he had. Oliver couldn't let it go. Just as Alice had done, he waited until Michael's workday was over and when he came out of the store, he walked toward him. Hey, you, you, you. Let's go aside. We need to talk. Michael shrugged his shoulders and followed the major to this car. Oliver came to his car, leaned on it, and ostentatiously playing with the keys, looked threateningly into Michael's eyes. You know, Alice? Well, this is my girlfriend. After these words, Michael immediately realized who was in front of him. Alice was telling him about her ex-boyfriend, with whom she had dated not seriously, out of boredom and broke up immediately, barely meeting Michael. Ex-girlfriend, as far as I know, Michael smiled. You two broke up and now she's dating me. She's the one who thinks we broke up, but it's not up to her. I didn't break up with her. In fact, Alice is mad at me, so she's using you to make me jealous. When she cools off, we'll be fine. I don't think so, Michael countered. You don't get it. Oliver began to argue. If I ever see you around Alice again, I'll tear your legs off. Rip it out. Rip it out right now, what's stopping you? I'm telling you right now, I'm not giving up on Alice. You're a tough one, I see, Oliver shouted and looked at his opponent appraisingly. 
Yeah, he'd probably lose to this guy in a direct confrontation. Michael was taller and shoulders taller, and judging by his gait, he's no stranger to sports. Oliver's favorite places to hang out were hookah joints and clubs. I warned you, make your conclusions, Oliver said through gritted teeth, retreating to the driver's door. I'm a man of my word. If I see you with Alice again, you'll be sorry, very sorry. But that's if you live. Wow, what threats, Michael laughed. I also repeat, I will not give up Alice. These words the guy said after the departing car, in which sat Oliver, seething with anger. Oliver was used to the fact that everything in life was easy for him. Thanks to his father's money, and people, as a rule, always passed him up, seeing expensive clothes and a cool car. But those people are smart, Oliver thought. This one must be a fool. Fools are taught. Let him try not to listen to me. And it wasn't that Oliver needed Alice so much. He had plenty of girls like her, but his wounded ego called for action. After a couple days, Oliver was convinced that the salesman hadn't heeded his words and was still seeing Alice. Oliver sat in his car and watched them walk down the street holding hands. Anger boiled up inside. The guy already knew what he was going to do. Taking his gaze away from the couple annoying him, Oliver called one of his acquaintances. Leshy, hey, I've got a favor to ask you. You've got the contact info for these badass athletes. Yeah, yeah, they're the goon squad that do certain favors for money. Set me up with them. I got a good paying assignment for them. What do you care? I just need to teach a sucker a lesson. A good one. Oliver in his car was following Michael down a dark street. Michael had just seen Alice off to her house and had gone back on foot because the buses weren't running because of the late hour. He couldn't even call a cab. Oliver sneered, driving slowly. Oliver waited for Michael to enter the dark alley. In addition to the driver, there were four big, pumped up guys of gangster appearance in the car. These guys were providing some services for a fee. And Steve went about them as completely badasses. We won't follow him for long, one of the jocks muttered. There's a good spot over there. He's about to make a turn and stop. We'll book him there. But let's talk terms right away. How do we take the guy down? Like cold turkey? No, do the whole thing, Oliver shuddered. Just break his legs, that's all. Well, maybe he could spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Deal, said the jock, pulling his balaclava over his face. Keep in mind, if this guy points you out, forget about us. When they take you for one place, you better not even think about us. I can't be taken for this place, Oliver said pathetically. Do you know who my father is? We've heard, the jock muttered through gritted teeth. All right, clients turned stop. Michael walked home happy, thinking about Alice. How'd he like this girl? At first, he thought that Alice is a major, but she turned out to be not spoiled by money and easy to communicate. At least in front of Michael, the girl never boasted of wealth and gladly went with Michael to the movies, walked around the city, visited inexpensive caves, and although Michael clearly felt their social inequality, still in the depths of his soul, he had a hope that they could do something. After all, the young people did not want to part in the evenings. Michael was walking with a slight smile on his lips when out of the darkness a big guy with a bat in his hand stepped toward him. His face was not visible, as it turned out later, not only because of the darkness, he was wearing a balaclava. At first, Michael didn't even get excited, thinking that he was mistaken for someone else. But then a man's voice sounded behind him, which seemed vaguely familiar. Well, we've met, just as I promised. Michael turned sharply to look at the man who was speaking. It was Alice's ex-boyfriend, who had threatened him a few days ago. Don't say I didn't warn you, Oliver grinned. I keep my word. Georgia was working the night shift, and it was business as usual, except that Michael wasn't returning her calls. That made the woman a little worried. Her son didn't call back after a while, as he always did. Georgia calmed herself with the thought that Michael must have fallen asleep after a long day at work. He still managed to go out with his new girlfriend after work. Georgia did not approve of the relationship, having learned that the girl was from a wealthy family. The woman thought that such relationships could not lead to anything good, but let them sort it out themselves. Georgia was especially upset in the morning, although the time was still early, but usually Michael had already gotten up for work. Not only had he never called back, but his phone was unavailable. The woman had barely waited until the end of her shift 
and was about to run home when she was called from her post. Georgia, can you drop off the case histories at the emergency room on the way? Yeah, sure, Georgia nodded, grabbing the papers. I'll do it, it's no problem. The woman went down in the elevator, and her heart clenched with a bad feeling. Already heading for the exit, she caught herself and rushed to the waiting room. There at that moment, they were carrying a patient from the ambulance on a stretcher. Imagine, a very young guy. They found him when it started to get light. We don't know how long he'd been lying there. He was beaten up, badly beaten. We need to get him to intensive care, the paramedic from the ambulance told the emergency room nurses. Georgia herself didn't know what made her, what force made her, approach the stretcher and look into the face of the beaten boy. Her heart stopped beating, her eyes were covered with a veil. The woman fainted, right in front of the stretcher. What's wrong with her? The paramedic was surprised. That's the nurse from surgery, right? Yeah, that's Georgia. She looked at the guy and collapsed right away. Must be someone she knows. What if it's? Oh my God, she told me she had a son that age. God forbid. Georgia came to her senses on the couch where the nurses had moved her. She remembered everything right away. The guy, the guy they brought in in the ambulance. He's in the ICU, Georgia. Do you know him? Georgia jumped up off the couch and rushed out of the emergency room. It must be her son. I'm not mistaken, the nurse muttered. What a grief. Even though Georgia was a nurse, they wouldn't let her in the emergency room, no matter how hard she tried. We're going to do everything we can to help your son, and you don't need to see him right now, believe me. There's nothing you can do to help him now. Here, take his things for now. The doctor put a bag of clothes in one hand and Michael's cell phone in the other. Georgia accepted it and absently pressed the power button. The phone, beeping merrily, blinked with a lighted screen. The screensaver showed his face pressed against the girl's cheek. There she is, his Alice, Georgia thought. Wow, how much did my son talk about her and he never bothered to show a picture. Then numerous social media messages from this Alice girl Zamordianized on the screen. Michael, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you answering? Georgia clicked on one of these messages and found herself on the girl's page. What an interesting status she had. My favorite is the best in the world. Did she write that about Michael? Swallowing back tears, Georgia thought. Maybe this girl actually loves him. I'll have to tell her what happened, but later, when my son comes to the senses, and Michael must, must come to the senses. Otherwise, there's no reason for me to go on living. My son is the only thing that makes sense in my life. I've already lost my beloved husband once, but then there was Michael and there was something to live for. The girl Alice apparently saw that Michael was online and sent a bunch of new messages urging him to answer her. Georgia flipped down the screen. Alice's pictures flashed up. There she was at home. Yes, this girl is not a poor girl. Yeah, and here she was, apparently with her parents. Georgia fixed her eyes on the face of Alice's mother. The phone fell out of her hands. The woman slowly slid down the wall, passing out for the second time that day. Diana and her husband were having dinner. It was one of those rare evenings when John came home early and Diane herself had no plans. The couple ate in silence. It had been a long time since they'd had a common topic of conversation. Diana didn't want to know how her husband was doing at work, and he wasn't interested in how his wife spent her time. Their only common topic was their daughter. After a long silence, John asked Michael a question. Where are we with Alice? I don't see her that much lately. Where is she? How should I know? The wife shrugged her shoulders. She doesn't report to me. Probably out with her boyfriend. What boyfriend, Oliver? You're out of touch with life, Diana snorted. Our daughter broke up with Oliver. She's got another friend of her heart now. She hasn't brought him home, and something's gone wrong there, judging by how nervous Alice has been the last few days. How is it, Diane? You stay at home and you don't talk to your daughter at all. No matter where you ask, you never know where she is. I realize she's a big girl, but not so big that you can't control her. Does she let herself be controlled? Diana exclaimed indignantly. Tonka is like a prickly hedgehog, snapping at you when you ask her anything. She only snaps at you. And that's what I don't understand, because you're her mother. You're supposed to be close, but you're the opposite. 
John did not have time to finish, as a disheveled Alice burst into the dining room and began to shout at her mother. Mom, what happened on the river 15 years ago? Tell me now. Alice, are you out of your mind? John frowned. Why do you let yourself yell at your mother? And what's the matter with you anyway? What's that look? Did you get into a fight with someone? John noticed a bright red scratch on his daughter's cheek. I wasn't in a fight, Dad. A complete stranger tried to beat me up. Alice plopped down on a chair and grabbed a glass of water from the table and began to drink greedily. Frowning John looked at his daughter and waited for her to get drunk and explain to him what was going on. I'll tell you everything first, Dad, said the girl seeing her father's tense look. I'm seeing a guy right now. His name is Michael. He's nice, very nice. He's a part-time graduate student, and he's working so he can help his mother. She raised him alone. Michael always spoke only warmly of his mother. I love Michael, Dad, I really do. It's not just a childhood crush anymore. Three days ago, he disappeared. Stop contacting me. I couldn't breathe at the thought that he might have left me. I really couldn't breathe without him. Every day I went to the store where he works, but the employees didn't know anything. Michael just disappeared, never showed up for work. And just today, one of the clerks found out what really happened to Michael. He was beaten up on the street and he's still in intensive care. I found out what hospital he was in and I ran straight there. And his mom was there. Dad, you have no idea what happened. She attacked me in the hospital hallway. At first, I thought the woman was crazy. She wanted to scratch my eyes out. I couldn't understand how a person who didn't know me could lash out at me with such hatred. But she didn't do it silently, she screamed. Screaming that I was the curse of her life, that 15 years ago she lost her beloved husband, his father, because of me. And now Michael had been beaten up, again because of me. When the nurses pulled this woman away from me, I started screaming too. I yelled at her, you're crazy, I've never met you before. Why do you think Michael was beaten because of me? And what does your husband have to do with it? Ask your mother. Let her tell you how 15 years ago my husband gave his life for someone else's child on the river. For you. Your mother was too drunk and partying to watch her own daughter. Michael's mom told me to get out of the hospital and never dare go near her son again. And I love Michael. And I'm not going to listen to her. I don't know how badly he was beaten. But if he dies, I die with him. Now I ask you, Mom, so what happened on that river 15 years ago, and why does that woman hate me so much? Diana sat there, neither dead nor alive. She straightened in her chair like a taut string, and the woman's eyes darted from her husband to her daughter. Diana realized what she had feared for so long had happened, and then she relaxed. Time had passed, all was forgotten. That's what Diana thought, and it turned out that's how the truth came out. The woman rolled with a nervous laugh. I don't know what you're talking about, Alice. This is really crazy. I don't think so, said a pale John. For some reason, I remembered the story on the river very well. A man drowned there, saving someone else's child. Why do I remember it? Because at the time, I thought a lot about that man's selflessness. I even gave his widow money as financial aid through other people. But what makes her think it's you, Alice? She's deluded. Maybe you look like that girl. Maybe someone put it in her head. Okay, John got up from the table abruptly. Now you and I are gonna go with her and we're gonna get to the bottom of this. Yes, yes, let's go, Daddy, Alice nodded often. Tell that crazy woman that she is wrong and I want to see Michael. I want to know what's wrong with him. You don't have to go anywhere, Diana shrieked. You've already realized that this woman is not in her right mind. Apparently, she's a disturbed woman. Diana faltered at the suspiciously angry look her husband gave her and realized that the seed of doubt had already been planted in him. Georgia was sitting on the couch in the nurse's lounge, drinking valerian. Georgia, what are you doing? A nurse she knew said with horror. Why are you so hard on that girl? I thought you were going to tear her hair out. Is this really the girl who drowned your Steve? Well, even if it was, it wasn't the girl's fault. Guilty as charged, exhaled Georgia who had become a little sluggish under the sedatives. My son was beaten up because of that girl. I lost my husband because of her. I hate her and her mother. I hate them so much. Why, why did they come into our lives and become a curse on our family? 
An orderly came barreling into the nurse's room and looked at Georgia warily and said, Georgia, there's this. A man's here with the girl you've been roughing up. Apparently it's her father, and he insists on talking to you. They weren't allowed into the station, of course. They're waiting for you downstairs in the visiting room. Let me tell him you're sick and can't come out. This guy's very solid, probably wants to confront you for beating up his daughter. What? You think I'm afraid of them? Georgia jumped up. After what's happened to me in this life, I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. The worst has already happened. But Michael is still alive, said the nurse timidly. Yes, my son is alive. And to keep him alive, I must keep him away from this family. Georgia jumped up from the couch and ran past the nurse and the frightened nurse. Don't let anything happen again, the nurse muttered. What if there's a fight? Georgia's probably not in her right mind. I've been working with Georgia for years, and I'll never forget what happened to her when her husband drowned. Then she was all about Michael, living for her son, and here she is again. And it's all because of this family. It's like a fate, really. Jonah and Alice. Georgia came down, seemingly calm. They had no way of knowing it was the sedatives they'd given her in the nurse's station. The drugs had given Georgia a certain lethargy, but her gaze still flashed with rage when she saw Alice sitting on a bench next to a stout man. John intercepted that look and jumped up from his seat, blocking his daughter. Your name is Georgia and you beat my daughter. I'm not going to return the favor. I think you were acting in a state of shock. I take it this is all about a story from 15 years ago on the river. Only tell me, what makes you think Alice is the girl who drowned? You're deluded. Am I mistaken? Laughed Georgia bitterly. Do you really think that I saw a resemblance to that child in Alice and threw myself at her because of that? I didn't. I just recognized who her mother was. You're dying I'll remember for the rest of my life. What are you doing here, messing with me? You can't be ignorant of that story. I heard of that story and I admire your husband, but I never imagined it would happen to my girl. If you're right, my wife hid everything from me. Tell me exactly what happened. What happened? Your dying got drunk with a friend and two guys and didn't watch your daughter. The girl fell off a cliff. Steve and I were on our way home when panic set in. My husband jumped in after your baby. He knew. He knew about the vortex, and he warned me repeatedly not to go near it. Steve knowingly sacrificed himself for a chance to save someone else's daughter. Then I came to your house to ask for money for the funeral, alone, but your wife treated me like a beggar, reprimanded me and said that no one asked my husband to jump, it was his own fault. She couldn't have said that. John shrieked. Diana is far from perfect, but she's not that cynical. I see you don't know who you're living with, and you don't know what goes on in your own home. How can you not know that your child almost drowned? You're a bad family. You're a rotten family. Steve and I had a real one. We loved each other. And after he died, life became a struggle to survive. Your daughter's living the good life. She's a beautiful, spoiled brat. But my son is in intensive care because of her. I don't know if he's going to make it. What do you mean you don't know? Michael could die. Alice cried from behind her father's back. And why me? Why are you blaming me for everything? Because your ex-boyfriend beat up Michael with the help of some thugs. His name is Oliver. Michael regained consciousness and told the coroner everything. Oliver? Oliver did it? Are you sure? John was surprised. I know his father well. A lot of people know his father, believe me. And the investigator's eyes glazed over when he heard that name. It's already clear that Oliver won't be held accountable for anything. He will. John said imperiously, looking intently into George's eyes. If he's guilty, he will, I give you my word. His father is a powerful man, of course, but I'm not the last man in this town. I'll do my best, but Oliver will be held accountable, and someone else will, and we'll see you again. John said the last words as he walked toward the door, dragging his daughter by the hand. Alice was crying. Why, why did you say that Michael might not survive? She looked back at Georgia. That was all the girl cared about at that moment. Diana sat in the living room, all tense and ready for the upcoming conversation. It seemed to her that she was ready. Well, after all, it had been so many years. She was young and foolish. John must discount that. As her husband whirled into the house and opened his mouth, 
Ready to unleash the full force of his anger on his wife's head, she prevented him from doing so by speaking first. I get it, you found out. You are aware that it was Alice, that she was the one who drowned in the river, so. Yes, I made a mistake going to the river, but that was a long time ago. I would have told you back then. But do you remember how you acted? How do you blame that negligent mother you said you had, not knowing it was me? And I was right. John roared, I still think so. Neglectful, you put it mildly. I think much worse of you. You've never been a normal mother. And I've put up with you all my life for my daughter's sake. And now it turns out our daughter might not be alive if it weren't for a stranger, and all because of you. What are you talking about? Diane is boiling. He tolerates me, and I don't? Or do you think life with you is easy? You're never home. How many times have we been away together? I can count on my fingers. You think that's life? Well, as far as I'm concerned, you're living life to the fullest. Or do you really think I don't know about your young lovers? I just didn't care. I don't care about you, Diane. About you or how you spend your time. As long as you don't bother me. I didn't divorce you so I wouldn't traumatize my daughter. Then there's that damn disease, your infertility. I'd be a bastard to divorce you, leaving a sick wife. So I put up with it. I haven't felt anything for you for a long time, and I don't care if you're going out. But now that I know you almost killed a child, lying to me and shitting on the soul of Steve's widow who turned to you. You're such an asshole, Diane. I don't want to see you another day. You realize this is the end of our married life together. Diane was furious, realizing that nothing could be done now, and John would divorce her anyway. She wanted to hurt him too. So be it. Go ahead and divorce him. I'll tell you what, you're not only a horny deer, you're a dumbass. You say you live with me because I'm infertile. I'm not infertile. I didn't want to have a baby. I didn't want to nurse those little smotty babies. And I didn't care that you wanted a son. So you had to settle for just a daughter. John squinted angrily at his wife and unexpectedly for her laughed. Do you think you've trampled me now? Don't get your hopes up. Yes, I felt sorry for you and believed you. So I did not leave you. But I wasn't gonna give up my kids because of you. I've got a second family with two kids growing up. The oldest is 10 years old. And now I won't even wait for an official divorce from you. I'll bring them here as soon as you leave the house. And you'll be out of the house fast. And I'll talk to Alice. I don't think she'll want to go with you. You're such a bad mother. Your daughter will never support you. Diane was trying to play nice and get a divorce. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. I won't be alone either. And in the divorce, I'll take half of everything you own. It's not gonna work, Diane. You're gonna walk away with your ass naked. You think because you've been cheating on me for so long, I haven't taken care of it. You sign the papers without realizing it, and you get nothing in the divorce. That can't be. Diana shrieked. You bastard. I didn't sign anything. And if you did, I'll hire a lawyer to prove that you did it all by deception. What are you gonna hire a lawyer for, Diane? It takes good money to hire a good lawyer. Now who has more money, you or me? You know, when I slicked you those papers to sign, I wasn't really planning on using them, just in case. And now I realize you're being punished. It's a little punishment for being such a scumbag. Oliver was rocking out in the club to the rhythmic sounds of loud music when two men in civilian clothes approached him, quickly waving a crust in front of the guy's face. One of them threw, you're under arrest. Oliver was a little stoned and he found himself laughing eerily. I'm in custody. Do you even know who you're talking to? Do you know who my father is? We know, we know, muttered one of the cops, roughly pushing Mitri into the duty car. We know everything, all questions to the superiors. It was necessary to see the confusion on Oliver's face when he realized that what was happening was not a joke, not a prank of friends, and he was really being taken to the station, knowing who his father was. The next morning, a confused secretary came into John's office. John, there's a man here to see you. I told him you were busy. Get out of the way, rudely pushed the girl away, a full balding man in an expensive suit, bursting into the office. Hello, John. I'll get right to the point. My son was arrested yesterday. Can you believe it? Oliver was arrested right in the club. I know, John replied, making no attempt to stand up and offered his hand to his old acquaintance. You know, don't you? The man frowned. And I thought it wasn't true when I was told that this arrest had its roots in you. 
It's true, Archie. Your son brutalized a guy and he's gonna be held accountable for it. Who said that? The big man got all worked up. Who's the boy? It was just a fight over a girl. Your daughter, by the way. But that guy's nobody and his name's nobody. I don't get it, John. Do you have a personal grudge against me? No, it's nothing personal. It's just that the guy's not a stranger to me. Consider it that. Who is he to you? Archie's confused. Is he so close to you that you're going to fight with me over him? Very close. I'm ready to fight if I have to. John got up from the table. You know, it's just that whoever has the most money is right. In this case, you lose. I'm not doing anything illegal, and your son will be held fully accountable for what he did. And he's going down. You want to fight me, Archie? Believe me, I'll go all the way. Sweat beaded on the big man's bald head. He'd known John for years and knew that when he said he'd go all the way, he'd go all the way. Archie knew the man's stubbornness firsthand, and Archie knew John's capabilities too. John, come on really. We've known each other for years too. What's he gonna do? Go to jail. It's not that big a deal. Maybe he'll get off on probation. He won't, John said meaningfully. It'll be what the court says it will be. By the law at this time, Oliver's not your only son, is he? What would it be like for the other two if dad went bankrupt? Even so, Archie squinted at him. Even so, John cut him off. At the same time in the hospital, under the door of the intensive care unit, Georgia was sobbing. The doctor had recently told her the terrible news. Michael's kidneys were failing. He needs a transplant. Of course, he will be put on a waiting list for a donor organ, but Georgia has worked in medicine for too long and knew perfectly well what the chance of waiting for that waiting list is. Mine, take mine, Georgia shouted without hesitation. The doctor nodded, as if knowing her mother's reaction in advance. Yes, it is possible in principle. Let's go through the necessary examination and we will make sure that your organ is suitable for transplantation. And so, a few minutes ago, the doctor said that her kidney is not suitable. As she wept, Georgia tried to pull herself together, stop crying, and find a solution. Something had to be done. Michael could go on for hours. She of all people should know that. The woman straightened up, wiped her tear-stained eyes, and only then saw Alice peeking out from around the corner leading to the emergency room. Brave fool, thought the woman. Have you come again? Did I not clearly tell you not to show your face here anymore? Kill me. Alice took a step out of the corner. Kill me. Pull out all my hair. I'll still come here. I've been standing here a long time and I heard you talking to the doctor. Michael needs a kidney transplant and yours isn't a match. Take mine. I'm ready. Georgia looked carefully at the excited, covered with red spots girl. Dummy, do you realize what you're proposing? It's not an easy surgery. Anything can happen when you take a donor organ. You could die. But even if everything goes well, you'll only have one kidney and that's not a full life. Do you realize that? I'm not as stupid as you think I am. I understand the risks. Even if I die, I'm okay with it. No, that's not the right word. I don't agree, I insist. I would rip a kidney out of myself just to keep Michael alive. When I think he might be gone, I don't want to live. Georgia looked at Alice thoughtfully, as if seeing her for the first time. You stupid girl, you don't understand anything yet. You're a minor and you don't have the right to decide such things. Maybe, I admit, you really love my son, but I can't do anything about my dislike for you. Alice flew out of the hospital like scalded and threw herself on the roadway, blocking the way of a yellow car with a checkered flag. The cab driver braked sharply, almost touching the girl standing on the road with his bumper. He jumped out and attacked her, almost with fists. What are you doing, you crazy girl? You're sick of living. Go throw yourself off the bridge. What do I have to do with it? Alice didn't listen to him. She ran to the passenger door, opened it, and got into the car. I need you to take me downtown now. I'm not getting out of the car. Take me. I have to go to my father's office. The cab driver was already eyeing the unstable passenger with apprehension. Either she was crazy, or this girl had something happen, and it was serious. The man silently got behind the wheel and turned the car around. John's secretary had only recently come to her senses after a visit from a man who had roughly pushed her, and then Alice burst in and raced to the door of her father's office. Your daddy doesn't have time. 
He has a meeting. The secretary shouted at her back. Alice flew into the office and not paying attention to several respectable men sitting at a long table shouted. Daddy, you have to authorize me to donate a kidney to Michael. Well, John said angrily. I didn't raise you well, daughter. Don't you notice anything around you? You don't see people sitting around and you barge in. Go out to the waiting room and wait there. No, dad. This case can't wait. Michael could die. Okay, got it, dad sighed heavily. He turned to his staff. Would you mind leaving us? The meeting is adjourned. Sorry, family matters. The men rose at the same time and looking disapprovingly at the chief's ill-mannered daughter, left the office. I'm listening to you carefully, Alice. What happened there? I was at the hospital. Michael's kidneys are failing. He needs an emergency transplant. His mom's kidney isn't a match. He has to wait in line and he might not get it, you know? I'm young, I'm healthy, I can easily live with one kidney. But I'm a minor, you have to sign the authorization. That's out of the question. John cut him off. Alice screamed. She screamed and screamed, not noticing that her father was sitting with his hand on his head, not paying any attention to his daughter, thinking carefully about something. Shut up, Alice, he finally said, raising his head at Alice. I already told you. You won't be Michael's donor, I will be. If my kidney is a match, of course. But somehow I think it will. It has to be. Michael's father gave his life for you, and I'm only giving a kidney for his son's life. Diane stalked her daughter outside the school. It's not the first time a woman's done that. And it wasn't because she missed Alice. She needed the money. Of course, Diana left her husband's house not completely empty-handed, and she had money and jewelry in sufficient quantity but she had moved in with a young and voracious lover. Voracious not in terms of food, but in terms of needs. Having got in touch with Diana, the guy was used to living large and was not going to moderate his appetites. Moreover, now Diana lives on his territory, although he did not ask her to do so. Diana's money ran out lightning fast and the young friend began to hint that he was not going to provide for a grown-up aunt, and they had no obligations, they met only for pleasure. Diana felt humiliated, but she had nowhere to go, so she turned to her daughter for the first time. Alice, quite predictably, decided to stay with her father. Alice had money, her father was never stingy when it came to his favorite daughter, and she had given it to her mother several times, but the money was running out fast. Alice, hello, Diana waved her hand from the ajar window of the car, John had generously allowed her to take. I missed you, come on, get in the car. Alice sighed sadly and separated from the flock of girlfriends with whom she came down from the school porch. The girl walked towards her mother's car. I don't have any money was the first phrase of the girl when she sat down next to Diana. What? No money right away? Her mother pouted. Can't I just visit my daughter? I said I missed her. Don't lie to me, mom. You never miss me. In fact, you didn't need me. I realize that now. You came for money and I don't have any. Why not? Diane raised her eyebrows. What did your daddy turn his attention to his new kids? And you don't get anything from him. That's not the point, mom. Whether I get money from my father or not is none of your business. I don't have any more money for you. I know you didn't leave home empty-handed, and I know who you've blown it on. Don't come to see me again. Look, what arrogance. Diana curled her lips, and this is my daughter talking to me. Your father, too, such a hero, gave his kidney to some guy. The whole town's talking about it. It's all over the social media. Obviously, it's a PR stunt. After that, he's probably making a lot of money, but that he kicked his wife out of the house and brought in a second family, the story doesn't tell. How do you like living with your new family? How do you like your brothers? They're normal brothers, Alice said, and their mom is normal, even though she looks like a model, but she's homely. Running around, looking at daddy's mouth, Maybe he originally needed such a one. Maybe your marriage was a mistake, and maybe I shouldn't have been born. Then Michael would have a father, and I'm nothing but trouble. If Diana had been an attentive mother, she would have noticed that her daughter was depressed, but she didn't care about Alice. She was frantically thinking about how to go on living, and on what? Without money, her lover would obviously kick her out. He had made that clear. Alice didn't care about her mother's worries either. With a loud slam of the car door, she jumped out and ran to catch up with her friends. She didn't want to go home. 
It was true that her father had a new family, and not that Alice had anything against them. She understood everything, because she was a grown-up girl, but it just became unusual in the house. Alice felt superfluous, and maybe not even in the house, maybe in this life. And everything seemed to be fine. Not so long ago, Alice was so happy when the kidney transplant operation on Michael was successful, and it became clear that the guy will live. John, who had donated his organ, was also feeling fine. He had already been discharged from the hospital. And with Michael, everything was more complicated. He was still lying, but, as the doctor said, was on the mend. And Alice found out through her father. Georgia did not let Alice near her son and forbade the girl to go near the hospital. I am grateful to your father, but together with Michael, you cannot be, said Georgia. You bring only unhappiness. And Alice believed in these words. The girl actually began to feel that way. She sank into a severe depression. She didn't want to do anything at all, neither to go home, nor to go out with her friends. Why nothing though? She wanted to be with Michael, but that was impossible. John was working in his office. Doctors, after discharge, strongly advised bed rest, but the man felt normal for a long time. He tried not to go to the office yet. He did things from home. The man did what he promised Diane he would do. Right after he kicked her out of the house, he brought his second family here, having talked to Alice beforehand. The boys were happy, and Kendall, their mom, was blowing John away. She never entered his office without knocking, afraid to disturb him while he was working. So now, there was a scraping at the massive door, and Kendall's head appeared. John, Alice's friend is here to see you. She wants to talk to you. Would you like to come out to the living room? Or should I bring her in here? Send her in here. There's probably boys walking around on their heads in the living room. That's just the way it is, Kendall smiled. A couple minutes later, Alice's close friend, Alfia, entered Jonah's office. Hello, she said with embarrassment. Alice doesn't know about my visit to you, and you don't tell her or she'll be offended. I'm worried about her. What's wrong, Alfia? I can see Alice is sad, but it's because of Michael. His mom won't let them see each other anymore. Alice will get sad and forget him. Sad. Forgetful? Exclaimed Alfia. I wouldn't call it that. Do you know that your daughter climbs to the roof of an unfinished high-rise and stares down for hours? What do you think she's thinking at that moment? I'm really scared for Alice. She's got it in her head that she's bringing misfortune to others. And she doesn't want to live without Michael. At first, I thought it was just a crush and she'd forget him, but you know, it's not. Alice loves this guy, really loves him. We have to do something. I'm afraid for Alice. After the girl said that, John was worried. He didn't realize his daughter's feelings for Michael were so serious. Georgia took her son's things out of the hospital bedside table and put them neatly into bags. Finally, we're coming home with you, son. I made you some pies with cabbage, just the way you like them. The woman chattered on. Michael was gloomy and his mother knew why. Alice. From the very beginning, as soon as the boy came to the senses, Georgia had told him she wouldn't let him date Alice and told him why. You want me dead, go ahead. He's seen this girl, step over your mother. These were the words with which the woman ended her speech. She was not affected even by the fact that John donated his kidney to Michael and the fact that the man opened a large money account in the name of her son. The money, by the way, the woman refused for a long time and was about to give it back to John. That's when their first serious conversation happened. This is a small part of what I have to do for you. Steve gave his life, and I just gave a kidney. Of course, money won't bring your husband and father back to you, but Georgia, think about it. Wouldn't Steve have made that money if you were alive? And whose fault is he not? That's just it. I want Michael to get a college degree full-time and not work like he does now. And you, stop scrubbing floors in your hospital. It's time for a vacation. Michael will graduate and if he has the brains, start his own business. He'll have some startup capital. Let me do at least that for you. Georgia thought, thought long and hard, then she got it out. Okay, we'll take the money. Let Michael have a chance at a normal future, not like mine. But you know I'm not gonna let him see Alice anyway. That's your right, John shrugged, taking youthful relationships lightly. Georgia and her son walked out of the hospital gates, 
and Michael breathed in the fresh air he had missed in the hospital room. At that time, a huge SUV pulled up beside them. John jumped out of the car and grabbed the bags from George's hands. Get in the car and I'll give you a ride, he said. We'll take the bus, Georgia stubbornly argued. The man, not listening to the objections, literally pushed them into his car. A little way from the hospital, he turned into the first parking lot he could find. He turned off the engine and half turned around to look at Michael in the back seat. So, Michael, how do you feel about my daughter? I love her, he answered without a second thought. I see, John stretched out. Then why did you put up with your mom's ban? Michael hesitated. Then, lowering his eyes, mumbled, I didn't. What? Georgia shrieked from the front seat. She, too, turned to look at her son. What do you mean you haven't gotten over it? Michael, what are you talking about? Mom, look, all I can think about all the time is Alice. I understand, and I don't want to upset you, but I can't stop thinking about her. I was going to see Alice to talk to her. If she's okay with our breakup, then well. She hasn't, John shouted. She's very much not okay with it, so much so that she's thinking of jumping off the roof. And I got that from a friend of hers. Georgia, you're a reasonable adult. What are you doing? Let the young people decide their own fate. They're not to blame for our sins. The more we interfere with them now, the more they'll be drawn to each other. They'll run away if it's not their destiny, but we shouldn't decide that for them. If my daughter jumps off the roof, what then? Your Steve will have died for nothing giving his life for her. Georgia, wake up. Georgia was almost crying. Why are you making a monster out of me? I reconsidered my attitude toward Alice when she wanted to give her kidney, but I'm afraid I have a crazy fear. Michael put his hand on his mother's shoulder and smiled. Don't be afraid, Ma. Everything is definitely going to be okay now. All the skeletons are out of the closets and only happiness lies ahead. A week later, Two young people came to the cemetery, a guy and a girl. The girl had a huge bouquet of scarlet roses in her hands. Here he is, my dad, said the guy, stopping near one of the graves. A young man with an open, friendly face looked at the girl from the monument. Thank you, whispered Alice, placing the flowers on the grave. Thank you for my life and for Michael. John, the head of Contech, a new computer technology and development company, was driving home after a day's work. Things weren't going well at his firm. There had been crisis in the work before. The rise was replaced by a fall, but it had never been so bad. So his thoughts were on one thing. Why was his company losing money? Why the previously prosperous company began to lose orders? So many complaints about their products had never been. What happened? These thoughts did not give him peace. Everyone has problems in life. Some solve them easily and some run away from them thinking that everything will work itself out. That's exactly what Veronica thought, running away from her common-law husband. Having hastily packed a suitcase of her and her children's things, she went, as they call it, wherever she looked. Mommy, a cool light shouted little Tom. Come on, Green, he pulled her by the hand. Veronica reached the middle of the road and felt that she was falling. Her legs shook, her eyes darkened, but she did not let go of the child's hand. So as she fell, she pulled in with her. John's gaze lingered on her as she began to cross the road. She was tall, too thin for her height, and he didn't like that kind of woman. She was pulling a huge suitcase like a truck and wouldn't let go of the child's small hand. He could barely keep up with the woman's wide strides. While John watched her, the woman had collapsed onto the pavement and was now lying in the middle of the road with the baby crying and screaming for mommy. John was confused for a moment, then jumped out onto the road and picked up the woman and carried her into the passenger compartment of the car. Picked up the suitcase, the baby, and took her to his house. In such situations, one had to think fast, so he called a doctor friend and asked him to come to him urgently. What's your name, baby? Tom. I'm Uncle John. You know your mom's name? Yeah, Veronica. Veronica. Yes. You can't spell. Yes, I can't. But my mom says I'll learn. Sure you will. I couldn't say R either. And then I learned. Uncle John, what about my mom? I don't know, kid. The doctor's gonna take a look at her and tell us. Jack, an internist of the highest caliber, arrived almost at the same time as the owner of the house. 
John carried Veronica into the house and put her on the couch. After washing his hands, the doctor began to examine the woman and lifting her dress. He saw huge bruises on the inner thighs. There were bruises on her neck and arms, and it was clear that the woman had been abused. John, I think she's been raped. I'll need to see her at the clinic and get her tested. What's taking her so long to wake up? She is. She's just having trouble opening her eyes. Veronica, can you walk? I, I was having a hard time with her words. You didn't answer my question. She tried to get up from the couch, but as soon as her feet hit the hard floor and her body straightened, her head started to spin again, and the doctor put her back down. Dr. Jack managed to get Veronica into this car. She resisted. She wanted to take the baby with her, but John was able to convince her that Tom would be fine. Her eyes were filled with fear. She knew it was wrong, but her strength was failing her. Back at the house, John's attention was drawn to Veronica's bag. Opening it, he saw a passport, Veronica, 27 years old. She was 35 now, but she didn't look so good. Little Tom was quiet and sat on the couch where his mom had just been lying. Come on, baby, let's get something to eat. What do you like? I like everything. Mommy's a good cook. How old are you? He saw the year of birth in the passport, but there must be something to talk about. I'm this old and he showed me all the fingers on his right hand. That's right, you'll be five soon, man, John said with a smile. Do you like mashed potatoes? Yes, that's good. I have an aunt who knows how to cook very well. Look what cutlass and mashed potatoes. The child looked into the deep frying pan and said it smells good. The boy ate very carefully and even knew how to use a knife, which surprised the man. Who taught you how to use a knife? My dad. His name is Jacob. I see. So you're Tom? No, I'm Tom. John had never dealt with such small children. He had never had any of his own, though he had always dreamed of a large and close-knit family. But it didn't work out. Ignoring the advice of his parents about the chosen girl for the role of spouse, he got married at the age of 22. Had to rent an apartment, a lot of work and moonlighting, but even this money his Veronica was not enough. Endlessly pouting lips, bad moods, and telling him off like a boy. It became so familiar and habitual that John stopped paying attention to it. If you're married, you're obliged to provide for your wife. I'm not saying no, but why shouldn't a wife help her husband? Go to work and supplement the family budget. Yes, Veronica wondered, that's not why I got married. And what for, I'm curious to know. To live in my own pleasure, not to work for pennies from morning till night. That was the last straw. I'll give you that opportunity. He packed up his things and left the keys to his rented apartment and left for good. She followed him for another six months and asked him to come back. But it took him two years to realize that his parents were right. He saw her again when he opened his company and became not rich, but the money appeared. Nick's nose was right. John, let's try it again. Let's start over. Try, try, but not with me. Veronica was in the clinic for a week. Jack gave her a cell phone so she could see her Tom every night. He played in a room with lots of toys, was cheerful and most importantly, healthy. Thank you so much, John. I'll never pay you back. Oh, come on. I'm glad I could help. And you got a great kid. He's trying to save the hours, so maybe by the time you leave the clinic, he'll be a surprise. She was crying and couldn't say a word. They put the baby in daycare. John would drop him off in the morning and Lana, a good, kind woman who lived next door to her daughter's family, would pick him up. Although Veronica saw her son every day, all sorts of thoughts came into her head. She had to restrain herself from these thoughts. She needed strength to recover, so she had to think about good things. John's appearance in her life had shifted her idea of people in her brain, because living in her husband's house, she had lost her faith in kindness. The clock was already midnight. It was the last night in the clinic. She could not sleep. There were so many emotions inside. It was necessary to solve many problems. With housing, with work, with kindergarten. There are many questions. There are no answers to any of them. But she will try to do everything for the sake of her son. All the same, sleep took her in its tender embrace. And only in the morning, a young nurse woke her up to give her the last injection. Meeting Veronica from the hospital was John and his son. It seemed to her that Tom had grown and gotten better. Mom, I missed you. I missed you too, son. 
Mommy, Uncle John taught me how to say fish, cancer, frame, radio. John smiled. He liked that boy. Thanks, John, for everything. Glad I could help. John, please take us to the hotel and I'll start looking for an apartment tomorrow. I'll pick up your stuff later, okay? How about this? You'll look for an apartment in my house. I don't want to drag the kid around to hotels. Then he has to go to kindergarten tomorrow. His teachers praise him. He's already found a girlfriend there. Son, don't make any decisions without your mom. Uncle John says a man should be independent and reliable. Oh, you guys are getting serious. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, let's go home. The table was set. Tom was getting the hang of it. He knew his way around. He felt at home. Lunch turned into dinner and my son fell asleep in Veronica's arms. She put him to bed and returned to the table. Is everything all right? John asked, looking into the woman's eyes. Everything is just fine, Veronica replied, running her palm through his hair, then over his face, bringing a smile to John's face. He's learned to play gadgets and he can spell the letter R now. He really wanted to be home in time for you to come home from the clinic. This is really a surprise to me. Thank you. How did you get him into daycare? I know it's not easy. Lana's daughter, who picked him up from daycare, is the supervisor. It's simple. There was silence for a moment. Veronica spoke first. You probably want to know what happened to me. She looked at John, of course. You must know who you let into the house. But I don't think we can do it in one evening. You'll have to stay at my place with my son. Well, if you're not too bored with us. Not at all. I was born and raised in the country. You may have noticed that I'm tall. That's great. Probably only in the village they called me Kolomenskaya Versta, or Fireman's Messenger, whoever liked it. I didn't pay much attention, but I was a little offended. Boys were shy to approach me, because they were all shorter than me. My parents were simple people, my dad worked on a tractor, my mom was a milkmaid, she worked from morning till night, so my grandmother brought me up. She was the only one who knew what they called me at school. I'll never get married like that, Grandma. Who meets such a pole? Don't be in a hurry. At the right time, the right man will find you. I believe my grandmother, and when I met Jacob, Tom's father, I thought my grandmother's words were prophetic. He did find me. After high school, I went to the county seat and went to college to become a model designer. I've always been an excellent draftsman. Skinny long. But as I grew up, I gained meat, rounded out, and in college, they started calling me a model. What have you forgotten in this college, said the girls in the group, with your height and figure should go to modeling. So after graduating from college, I went to New York. Casting passed and began to work as a model. It was hard work, I was tired, but they loved me, in the sense that it was easy to sew on me. It was at one of these shows that Jacob saw me, and it was a siege. He was 10 years older than me, handsome, dressed expensively, but I was afraid of him. He looked like a bandit. No, not the knife-wielding kind, but the kind of gangster they call a businessman now. He had a fiery temper, and it was better not to get under his hot hand. And I'd been hit more than once. That's why I was afraid of him. He never suggested marriage, but he provided for me. And when Tom was born, he was glad. I thought that was happiness. I just never got to see the real happiness. I tried to leave several times, but immediately I remembered hard times, debts, lack of money. My friend kept whispering in my ear, you're a fool, Veronica. Everyone envies you. Such a man paid attention, wanted a child from you, and you? Remember, my dear, that figure, breast, and everything that you have on your face is temporary. And this temporary comes so quickly that it becomes scary, and you are in the group of divorcees rushing. Take into account, you are a special divorcee with an extra, such not every man will pull and in general will want to pull, who meets someone else's kid and I put off leaving every time. But this time was the last straw. Did he rape you? John asked a question and regretted it at once, because Veronica shrank, her hands shook, and the answer to the man was silence, oppressive, sepulchral, pressing like a tombstone. Did he rape you? John asked the question and regretted it immediately, because Veronica clenched her hands shook and the man's answer was silence, oppressive, sepulchral, pressing like a tombstone. The eyes of a frightened woman looked up at him. She clasped her trembling fingers around the hot mug, from which there was a pleasant tea aroma and taking in more air, 
wanted to answer his question, but she didn't. Whatever you tell me now, I won't run away with my heels clicking. I'll help you if I can. You're safe here. This is my home, and only the person I want here can enter it. I apologize for the situation on the road, and she's blushing. Come on, no one is immune to asshole violence. Only the last asshole would raise his hand to a woman. I always thought that, besides hands sure of strength, a man should have a heart. That a man should take the initiative. We've completely forgotten the age of romance. Now it is not fashionable to invite on a date, to the movies on the last row, treat ice cream. You go straight to, she looked at John, and he did not avert his gaze. Many of her statements he agreed with. He watched her nervously walk around the table, sipping sips of her long cool tea. She was indeed a tall girl. If he was six feet tall, she was about 10 centimeters shorter. Very thin, but it didn't affect her face. She had the right shape. Her eyebrows may be a little thicker than today's fashionistas wear, but those freckles could drive any man crazy. Blue eyes, her nose was a little upturned, like Tom's, and her lips were her own, without silicone. Her hair was in a ponytail now, but when he carried her into the house, after she'd fallen, it had spread out on the pillow. It was long and heavy, but she was a dyed blonde. Not a beauty, but very pleasant and far from shallow. When he woke up from his thoughts, she was silent. It was obvious she was gathering her thoughts. Jacob went to the season opening at the fashion house. There were a lot of people, all dressed up in beautiful outfits, the men in strict suits with bow ties. Champagne was flowing, music was playing loudly, laughter was heard from everywhere. For some reason, I was not worried. Probably I did not understand the degree of responsibility that the fashion designers and the management of the fashion house had put on us. The show was excellent, which I did not doubt. We were all given a bonus, and I remember I used it to buy warm boots. At the second show I noticed a man sitting on the front row. He caught my eye because he was wearing dark glasses. His hair, hair to hair and lightly unshaven. I noted to myself that he was an interesting man, but when this interesting man met me at the exit and offered to get into his car, which looked more like a tank, I refused, or rather, I was afraid. He did not ask me, but ordered me straight away. Get in the car, I won't hurt you. The phrase sounded ambiguous with a hint, say, and the money will be only after. I guess he preferred this format of relations. He forgot about romance or didn't know. There was no place for it in his life. Usually there were no misfires, so this time he hoped to make an effect. But the beauty did not fall for the usual tricks of the young man. I'm not interested in your proposal. I did not get into the car with strange men and do not poke me. We did not drink on a broader rift. The stranger's eyebrows went up. The refusal clearly hurt the man, but he was not going to give up. He's not a boy to pout his lips and take offense. Did not agree this time, will agree in another. But the girl was firmly planted in his head. And Veronica, taking advantage of his confusion, quickly disappeared in the car girlfriend, who took her home. From that day on, the siege of the fortress began. As Veronica saw Jacob again at a fashion show, he went to the fashion house with persistent constancy. Endless thoughts about the girl turned the grown man into a horny teenager. And one day, when she came out after work, he stood with a large bouquet and introduced himself as Jacob. Veronica said then, embarrassed, I know, said the man, I know all about you. Can I take you to a restaurant for dinner? I was really hungry so I went with him. He brought me home very late and invited me to the restaurant again the next day. No, Jacob, no offense. I'm a bit of a fan of these places. If you want to see me, let's just walk around. He agreed, and we walked around New York City all evening so I could finally admire her beauty. That's how we began to see him often, and in six months he invited me to his house. Of course, I understood why he called me there and how it could end, but I thought that he was my happiness he found me, as my grandmother said. After living in his house for a month, I began to feel a terrible pressure from his side. Veronica, you won't be working at the fashion house anymore. I don't want ugly men looking at my woman. Stay at home. Take care of yourself. Swimming pool, fitness, beauty salon, wherever else you go. Add more from idleness, he flashed such a look that inside everything turned cold. I don't want to sit at home and be a burden on your neck. 
I like my job and that's not the deal. You're not my husband and I'm not your wife. He left for work, slamming the door so hard I was surprised it didn't come off its hinges. It took me 15 minutes to pack my things and I left again to my apartment, which fortunately did not have time to refuse. In the evening, I had work to do and Jacob sat frowning in his seat with the bouquet. I didn't look at him and went home through the back exit. He rang the doorbell of my rental apartment for a long time, which I never opened. Luckily, it was the end of the season at the fashion house and everyone was on vacation. I'd rented another apartment, giving up my old one, which was very comfortable and cozy, but otherwise Jacob wouldn't let me rest. I even changed my SIM card. I decided to get out of Jacob's life completely. I managed to do it for exactly three weeks. He had everyone on edge, and one day I saw him with a bouquet when I came out of the driveway. I'm sorry, he rushed up to me. I'm an idiot, a jealous idiot. You're so beautiful and everyone's staring at you. I'm going crazy. Jacob, this is why we shouldn't be together anymore. I'm not quitting my job, and I'm not going to fight with you about it. Let's just be friends. No, I don't want to be friends. I want you to move back into my house. Do you hear yourself? I am, I am. I want, I demand, I'm going crazy. But where are my desires? They don't exist and can't exist if you're around, Mr. Jacob. I got away this time, but he wouldn't give up. There was no point in changing apartments. He'd find one anyway. So I decided to leave the house less. I saw his car parked in the driveway every morning. Diane, what do I do? Jacob won't let me leave. Come to my house. He's parked in the driveway every day, and I can't get out. It's not like he stays out there all night. When he leaves, call a cab and come to my place. So I did, and for another week I was fine. But as soon as I got to work, he took his seat in the front row. Oh, Veronica, there's your handsome boy again. He's your destiny after all. You can't abuse a man like that. I'm sorry. That's right. He loves you. After work, Jacob was waiting for me again, so I didn't run away from him. Okay, Jacob, I'll go with you, but let's make a deal. I'm working, no dictating, no pressure. I agree, he said, and I moved back in with him. After I moved in, I got pregnant quickly, even though I was on birth control. I didn't need a baby yet. I had nothing of my own. I lived in Jacob's house. I wasn't a wife, so I didn't have any rights, and then I had a baby. I went to my doctor showed her the pills and told her that they didn't help prevent pregnancy, but the opposite. They're the best on the market right now. They're the most reliable. Maybe you've been forgetting to take them. Then it really can happen. I was about to leave when she opened the box. Veronica, what did you bring me? These aren't the pills I prescribed for you. What do you mean, the wrong ones? I was surprised. They're the ones I bought at the pharmacy. Yes, the box is the same and they look very similar but you can't fool me. Who had access to those pills? Where did you keep them? In my bedroom, in my bedside table. I think they're pacifiers, vitamins at best. Leave them with me, I'll get them to the lab. That's how I found out Jacob switched my pills with regular vitamins. I had to apologize to the doctor. I didn't know how to tell him, but I didn't want to look stupid. So one night I did. Jacob, I can't believe you had to be so treacherous to get me to commit to you. You were thinking of yourself again, and I trusted your manly word. Do you realize what a terrible thing you've done? I can't trust you now. Tomorrow, you'll be sick of me, and you'll poison me. Fortunately, he did not start to gawk with surprise and refuse, and immediately said that I am very stroppy and tame me can only a child. So ended an episode in my life called The Taming of the Shrew. I was saved by my height and thinness. I worked practically until I gave birth under Jacob's evil stares. Tom was born, my sweet son, my joy and pride. Everything had changed in the house except one thing. I was still not Jacob's wife. It was all right with him. He loved his son and did everything for him. Now he was happy. I was at home with the baby, never going out. He brought everything, groceries, things, diapers, everything. I only went out for a walk with Tom and then around the house under the supervision of the guards. Then I realized what a golden cage was and how I wanted to escape from it. But the child held me back. When Tom turned three, I started talking about work. Jacob, I want to get a job. Where you want to put the baby? 
We'll get a nanny. We won't be the first. We won't be the last. No, he said shortly. He didn't explain anything. But I insisted, and that's when we had our first big fight. You keep me in this cage. I can't even meet my friends. What kind of captivity is this? And that's when he hit me for the first time. He smashed my lip. My nose was bleeding. You wanted to see your friends? Go on. I'm not keeping you. So I went out all night. Probably to the casino or to the girls. I didn't care. All night I lay with ice on my face, but there was a huge hematoma on my cheek. I got a call from work. Veronica, are we expecting you? How are you? Are you coming back? How long can you wait? Well, considering your previous achievements, six months, others wouldn't wait a month. You know how many people are interested. But there aren't many girls with your height and figure. Okay, thank you very much. I'll try my best. It was well past midnight. I'm tired, John. I'll see you tomorrow. Do you have security here? They won't let anyone in here. Don't worry, there's security. I'll tell them not to let anyone in. I'm not expecting anyone, and neither are you. Okay, I'll feel better that way. She fell asleep next to her son, calmly and without dreams. When Veronica woke up, the house was empty. Oh my God, I'd overslept. It's a shame, a stranger taking care of my child. She went down to the kitchen. There at the stove stood a pleasant woman in a beautiful apron and cook. The aromas were appetizing and even enticing. Her stomach rumbled immediately and the woman turned around. It seemed to Veronica that her body reacted very loudly to the mind-blowing odors. Good morning. You're so fragrant, it's impossible to remain indifferent. Your son gives me the same compliments. He does. He'll be a ladies' man. I think he'll be a fine man. Thank you. Sit down to breakfast. Lunch won't be for another three hours. John said he'd be here for dinner, which means six o'clock. After breakfast, she went to look around the house. The first floor was occupied by a large living room, kitchen, John's study, utility rooms, and two servants' quarters. And on the second floor was the master bedroom, two guest rooms, a shower, a bathtub, a toilet, a small exercise room, and a small room hastily furnished for Tom as a playroom. Veronica's heart squeezed with gratitude to the man, I'm lucky, Veronica thought, even though I hit my head pretty hard, I met John. She went into his office. She quietly opened the door and poked her head in and looked around. There was a nice desk, a big chair next to it, a lot of books and flowers. The violets were all in bloom. It was gorgeous. So they like it here, she remembered her grandmother's words. A flower will never bloom if it is not happy with that person. On the coffee table, she saw pictures. John was looking at her from one. Brunette, no more than 35 years old. Small curls cut very short and barely visible. Dark chocolate eyes, sensual lips. He looked like he was looking into the soul. It was obvious that he didn't come to be photographed on purpose and the lens caught him by chance. His shirt was carelessly unbuttoned a little more than was customary for men. She noted that he was an interesting man, but even that wasn't the main thing. He was kind and decent. The other pictures were of his parents and friends. She stayed a little longer in his abode and went to lie down, her strength not yet fully returned to her. She woke up to someone shaking her by the arm. When she opened her eyes, she saw Tom's son. Who brought you here? Lana. She's nice. He laid down next to his mother. I missed you so much. Then you have a bad time with Uncle John. He's interesting, but I missed you. My darling boy, I've been dying to see you too but the doctors wouldn't let me go until the treatment was over. It was just the two of them at dinner. John didn't show up as promised. They didn't wait for him and fell asleep. John had a lot of problems at the company. His security service did not sit idle and checked all the streams where the information goes from whom and most importantly, to whom. Tomorrow, John allowed all the employees to leave from lunch under the pretext of sanitizing the cafe on the floor below. He and his guys stayed the night to set up the security cameras for the surveillance cameras. John supervised all the work. The security guys were great. Not jocks, bouncers, just smart. They took a few people at a time and came to John a week later with the results. It was all on a flash drive. John was furious. The person he trusted the most was working for the man who was ruining his reputation. All right, 
Mickey was feeding him information and Tony, why is he off the hook, is our biggest customer. So this Christian guy fights with Tony, letting him know we're so cheap, working on two fronts. Who's Christian? Never heard of him. He's an ex-gangster, used to dealing in the 90s, thinks he can do it now. Find out more about him. All right, I'll have it on your desk in a couple days. Keep the cameras on a permanent basis. I'll only trust them after I've checked. I want Mickey in my office first thing tomorrow morning. Look the bastard in the eye. See what he's been missing. He arrived home in the morning, quietly showered and went straight to bed. But he woke up at 7 o'clock, as usual. Tom came into his room. Come in, John told him. The boy climbed up on his bed. Are we going to kindergarten today? Do you want to? I don't want to go a little bit. I want to be with my mom. Then it's settled. You have today off, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. That's how long you can be with your mom. Thank you, Uncle John. He took his face in his little hands and kissed him on the cheek. John felt it. It felt incredible. He had never felt like this before. Everything was turning over inside him. The contact with his palms let something warm and important into his heart. At some moment, he even wanted to press him to his chest to feel this childish sincerity and to see his smile without two teeth. I'm getting old. Hissing a child brings a tear to my eye. How imperceptibly old age crept up, the man thought with a smile. He remembered his serious conversation with Mickey, grumbled and quickly left for work. Tom was so happy to be with his mom all day long. How good it was talking to you, boy, not leaving Veronica's side. And I'm very well with you, my darling. After breakfast, they read, then played, walked, and after lunch, the child fell asleep like a dead man. And Veronica decided to call Diana. Hi, Frank, she said cheerfully. When are you going to work? Soon, soon. How's it going? Same old, same old. How are you and your handsome boy? What's new? She was always asking the same questions. She believed that the main thing in a girl's life is to find the right man who will provide from head to toe and solve all problems. She was not very successful, but Diana did not lose hope and after each failure again threw herself into the battle. She went to the most expensive restaurants to prestigious exhibitions, where you can often see wealthy men young and not so young. Veronica was used to relying only on herself. She left her parents early and realized that there was no one to help her but herself. She studied, worked part-time, solved her problems as best she could, including material ones, and never relied on anyone, especially not on a man. She did not rush into a relationship, as in the maelstrom, and cautiously looked at those who tried to hit on her. More often, she ignored all the signs of attention, waiting for the one and only one that her grandmother said. Veronica, are you all right? She was wary of such a question. Yeah, she stretched out. Why do you ask? So yours came running with bulging eyes, wanted to see you, went to the bosses, had heartbreaking conversations with me. Screaming, his wife and child are missing SOS. And what did he want? I wanted to know where you were. Where are you really? Maybe I'll come to your place and we'll talk. It doesn't matter where I am. Don't you trust me? Diane, it's okay. No offense. Bye. I'll call you later. After that conversation, she felt uneasy and regretted calling her friend. What did she say? Jacob asked Diane, who had been standing next to her the whole conversation. Diane was about to dial her number when Veronica called her. She didn't say anything. She said it's the right thing to do. You must have hurt her badly if she ran away from you and took her son with her. Don't worry. Diana took up to calm the man Diana such handsome men do not leave her, she purred buttoning up her shirt. Let's go somewhere distracting. Your Veronica's coming. She's not going anywhere. She came so close to him that she could smell his perfume. She leaned her cheek against his unshaven one and cried out. You're as prickly as a hedgehog. Shall we go out tonight? Let's do it next time. And after dropping the five grand, walked out of the fashion house. She liked Jacob when he first come to their show. But for some reason, he was attracted to Veronica. What did he see in her? Well, she had a nice figure, but that's about it. Those freckles that makeup artists put on every time they did a makeup job were a nightmare, but Jacob liked it. I don't understand these men, Diana reasoned. I'm probably doing terrible things to my friend, she thought, but it's not my fault, it's Jacob. 
He's provoking me, stroking my arm, and for nothing. I can't help myself and do something shameless. And what to do? I'm a living woman. I justify myself. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. John's workday got off to a rough start. First of all, he only got two hours of sleep. And secondly, Mickey was waiting for him outside his office. Looking at him, John thought he hadn't slept at all, which was almost true. He'd come to work straight from the casino. I guess he hadn't completely lost his conscience because it was embarrassing to look John in the eye. He took him to work for him, taught him a lot of things and considered him his friend. But Mickey was on the money. He was not only a good programmer, but also a talented mathematician. He developed an algorithm on how to win at casinos. It did not work at once. About a year he developed, tested in theory and several times in practice. And all this time his program did not fail. He bought himself a nice car, a small apartment, though not in the center, but his own. After the first winnings, he visited the casino too, three times a month to check the new changed algorithms and again Mickey was a winner. He was noticed and the casino workers became simply afraid of him, but he didn't abuse his luck. Once noticed the very angry looks, did not give the appearance, but did not go to the casino for three months. He began to live large, changed the apartment, a more prestigious in the center. He started vacationing abroad. This could not afford even the owner of the company, Comtech John, but Mickey could. When asked by a friend where such opportunities came from, Mickey replied briefly, Luck. One day, leaving the casino, he was stopped by a man. He was dressed expensively. Mickey now immediately recognized branded clothing. Listen, kid, tell me the secret to your success. To tell you the truth, Mickey was scared. It's called luck. Don't take me for a fool. I know a little bit about computers too, and I used to be good at math. Tell me. There's nothing to tell, said Mickey, getting in the car. But the man was persistent. Look, I'm not for free. Whatever dough you want, I'll pay you. I don't need your money when I work for a great firm and casino luck is on my side. He thought he told his new acquaintance enough to get him off his back. But he was wrong. The new acquaintance wasn't backing down. One day, getting into the car after another good win, a lanyard was thrown around Mickey's neck from behind. He wheezed, kept the Veronica around his neck, making it a little easier to breathe and only when his arms were hanging like whips was the grip loosened by patting him his cheeks. Shall we talk? An unfamiliar voice asked. Mickey could only nod. Taking a bottle of water and sipping almost half of it, he turned around. In front of him sat what appeared to him to be an unfamiliar man who had told him to keep the car lights off. Ready awake? Ready, he wheezed. It would have been a long time ago, and opening the door, Jacob shouted, Go, he's ready. A familiar man sat down next to him and introduced himself, Jacob. Mickey said and grinned wryly, realizing that the man sitting across from him had known all about him for a long time. Jacob asked in a winning voice, Look, I don't have anything to tell you. I have sketches, numbers, calculations, and they won't tell you anything, much less help you, and I can't explain anything. Do you play blackjack or poker? Jacob asked interestedly. I play everything. I'm interested in where and how accurately my algorithms work. You're not bluffing. Mickey didn't dignify him with an answer. He felt superior to the man who was listening with his mouth open. I can tell you what bets to place, but I won't be playing that day. But let's agree that I'm not going to stand behind you for the rest of my life. Okay, a month. No, that won't work. I'm not at the casino every day. Let's do it three times. No, that's not enough five, five times. Okay, five times and don't come near me again, especially not with the lanyard. It's a deal. The evening at the casino began with Jacob undecided. He stood between the roulette table and the poker table. He chose roulette. The bets were placed and the game began. Jacob's game started right away. Tonight was clearly his night. Mickey stood behind him and whispered in his ear. The roulette partner smiled wickedly the smartest ones leaving the table and the bravest losing their last money. Come on, Jacob. Let's go. We have to stop in time. The man nodded, collecting the chips he'd won and stood up from the table. He left the casino and quickly got into his car. 
Mickey was glad that his new algorithms hadn't failed him. The very next day, Jacob called Mickey, but he had other things to do. Don't you think I have other things to do than go to the casino every day? I'll call you when I have time, and he hung up quickly. Jacob was not happy. He stopped sleeping and took it out on Veronica, raising his voice at her and blaming her for everything. It wasn't until the following week that Mickey was able to go to the casino. But this time his system had malfunctioned and Jacob had lost in a landslide. He shook Mickey like a punching bag. You can kill me, the man shouted, but I warned you there's no algorithm in the world that never fails. You're gonna pay me back, okay? I'm not going to reimburse you, it happens. It didn't work for me every time. Indeed, the next time everything went well again. The winnings were so huge that the administration asked to pay the reward in installments, as they had a maximum amount that could be withdrawn. Mickey's intuition urged her to stay away from Jacob, but the desire to get a lot of money drowned out her voice. It wasn't until two weeks later that they were able to go to the casino again. Jacob was tearing up. Mickey had a work emergency, so he had to stay late to get his assignments in on time. The third and fourth camping trips were a failure, not at all. And Jacob had his fists in the air. Mickey had to take a week's vacation at his own expense, saying he had to go to his parents' house. Jacob was threatening him, and he'd already written him a letter telling him how much he owed him. But Mickey didn't have that kind of money. The last trip had been so modest that it hadn't even lifted Jacob's spirits, but instead lowered them to I want to die. You got the money? No. I don't have that kind of money and I won't for the next five years. Sell the car. Why on earth would you play? I warned you the system was flawed, so it's not my fault. Look, you're getting a little talkative. You might get in the car and not make it to the office. Get your money ready, asshole. To say Mickey was scared is an understatement. He tried to raise the money, but it was a pathetic attempt. I've got a proposition for you. Jacob said on the phone. I need some data on the orders your company got from Tony. You bring it to me, it'll clear the debt a little. We'll see about that. Your boss's firm is bothering me. There's too many of us on the market. Help me, I'll help you. And he decided to do it, figuring he'd do it with his shirt on. And so John's troubles began. And now Mickey was sitting outside his office and didn't know what to say for himself. It was embarrassing to talk about the shirt that was closer to his body. He suddenly remembered how much good John had done for him. As soon as Mickey walked into the office of the head of the firm, John realized that he would no longer work and trust this man. John wondered how he could be his friend. Those running eyes, the crunching of his knuckles, the pale face and completely insincere look. He was all fake. Right now, he didn't like this man at all. There were many questions about him, and the main one was why had he been so ungrateful? After stopping at the door, Mickey went to the desk and looked at the manager and said, John, let me write a letter of resignation. You will, because I can't trust you as I did before. Don't look at me like a beaten dog. You won't see any compassion for me. Believe me, I had no choice. There's always a choice. You just have to do it right. You did it wrong. Tell me who you gave it to. John, I'd advise you not to mess with this Christian. He's a realist fool. You two deserve each other. Tell me. When Mickey stopped talking, John felt that his story was true, that he was sorry for what he had done, but he decided not to say anything to him yet. So here's the deal. What you did for Tony and then sold the Christian, you fix it yourself. John, I want you to back out of this job and give me the money up front. It'll be easier. What are you talking about? You're suggesting I give up. Where am I gonna get the money to pay you back like you're suggesting? I pay my employees salaries and you too. You don't wanna give it back. It's a lot of money. Mickey shook his head. Well, I don't think anybody would. You're going to call Tony and tell him you've come up with a much more interesting solution to his order. But I haven't. I see. Here's your assignment for the week. Work hard and surprise Tony. Then you write a statement and I'll never see you again. John's week was up and he was still there. Nothing interesting came into Mickey's brilliant head. Friday night, John called him in. How'd it go? Mickey replied, shrinking back. I'll give you an update on Monday. I've still got to check the calculations. Is it really something interesting? I don't know. You'll see for yourself. John went to the store bought Tom a new constructor, packed a cake, candy, ice cream, 
a bobble of good comb neck and rushed home. He felt good at the mere thought that he was welcome. After that evening, when Veronica said she was tired, they never spoke again. Maybe tonight, this Friday night, they could sit longer and he would finally learn the whole truth. Tom welcomed him like his own daddy, but unfortunately, he'd never gotten to experience parental happiness. Uncle John, hello. Hi, you're saying R so well. Good job. Veronica stood back and smiled, looking at the relationship between her son and a strange man. He was afraid of his own father. He had been raising him to be a man since he was two years old. Stop hugging and kissing him. He's not a girl, Jacob shouted. But he's just a baby hiding the baby behind his back, his mother replied. My orders are not negotiable, yelled the father. Don't scare the child. We're not in the barracks, replied Veronica. Why do you have such a long tongue? Why don't you respect your husband? Keep silent. No, she's attacking him with her fist. Veronica grabbed Tom and left out of her husband's sight. She was afraid of him. And with a strange man, her son felt calm and quite happy. How was work? You've been in trouble. You haven't been yourself all week. Yeah, but it's getting a little better now. Rat caught, cornered. You can't corner a rat. It can bite so hard to survive. It's easier to just let it go so it doesn't make things worse. It won't. John's phone rang and he excused himself to the study. She watched her son unwrapping a present and heard Christian's last name. Did Christian call again? John asked in surprise. What does he want this time? Don't say yes, let him go to the casino, or you'll have to take off work to visit your parents again. I know all about it. What else you got? How's the assignment? It's good. You've got a good head. Bye. Looking into Veronica's frightened eyes, John asked what's wrong. Who's Christian? Sorry, you were talking loud. Yeah, he's an ex-gangster that my employee leaked information to. He's got me in a lot of trouble. Tom, let's go pack. We're leaving. Grabbing the baby by the hand, she rushed upstairs to pack. Veronica, what's going on? And after two flights of stairs, he stood in front of the door to the children's room. Can you tell me what it was about the Christian name that scared you so much? It was the first time he'd ever seen tears fall in hailstones. It always seemed when they showed it in movies that it was a montage that tears couldn't flow like that, one after another. But looking at this woman, John realized they could. If I don't leave your house, you're going to have problems not only at work, but in your personal life. He took her by the shoulders. You can answer in normal language. I don't need riddles. I have enough of them at work. She took a deep breath. Christian is my husband. He's the one I ran away from, the one who raped me when he and his friends got drunk. Mostly him, of course. One of his friends had a vase through my head. Another one held me down. And my husband was a bastard who abused me in front of them because I refused to let his friend to have a drink with them. That was the last straw. I didn't want to stay home anymore, and now he's looking for me. John was really dumbfounded that the thug was Veronica's husband and that he had allowed himself to be bullied like that. Do you understand now? You let me go now? But where are you going? You haven't even found an apartment. I'll stay in a hotel for a couple of days and I'll find what I need. No, Veronica, I won't let you go now. I'm not afraid of your Christian. You should be. He's a ruthless man without shame or conscience. How did you end up with him? I told you about the siege. That's how I got involved. How do you know he's looking for you? I called Diana. She told me. You shouldn't have called. He can track you on your cell phone. Let's change your Siam card. Come on, don't scare the baby. Let's go to dinner. We'll talk later. John, I don't want to drag you into a fight with that monster. I'm a big boy and I'll take care of it myself. So Veronica stayed. It was already 10 o'clock in the evening when at last Tom got tired of playing and running around and went to sleep. John and Veronica were sitting in the dining room eating ice cream. Tell me, what does your husband do? John asked. He didn't like it when I asked him what he was doing. You don't have to get involved in my business, he told me. You know less, you sleep better. And I stayed out of it. But I did hear that his computer company was going through a rough patch. I know that he steals cars and jams the license plates. He once had men come to him with such faces that it's scary to remember. I've always tried to stay out of their sight, and Jacob's just as bad. Veronica, 
make your specialty coffee for the guests, and I was shaking, trying to put everything on the table and run away. They were always arguing, fighting, and they use a lot of bad language. My child, and I would go to the back room so my son wouldn't hear this outrage. I'm sorry I asked you to tell me, John said guiltily. The memories are difficult, and I can tell you're uncomfortable. She didn't answer him, but continued. The last time they came, there were strangers, young guys, quite handsome. I even thought, well, this time it would be without any language and the negotiations would be quiet, but no. One of them caught me by the arm and pulled me down onto his lap. Jacob jumped up and hit me. Why are you wiggling your ass in front of men? Get out of here. I didn't have to deal with him and I wanted to leave. Veronica, come have a drink with us, the guy said. Don't touch me. That's no way for a guest to behave in someone else's house, I yelled. He stood up, pulled me against him, and I fumbled for the vase and smacked him on the head. The other one grabbed me, my dress snapping as I jerked, and that's when Jacob decided to show his manhood. I looked at his angry eyes and I was scared, not because he might raise his hand to me again, but because for the first time in my life, I decided to cross what Jacob thought was a red line. I decided to go against his will to rebel without fear of his fists. Ma had always idolized dad, saying he was king and God to her. And she taught me to live the same way. Always shut your mouth at the right time. Mom taught me, then the family will get along. My mom wouldn't understand me right now. I can't accept Jacob like that, even though he's my son's father. She was silent, her tears preventing her from speaking, and there was nothing more to say. In the morning, while my husband slept, I packed my suitcase with my own and the children's things and left. I left the house that had long been my fortress and my golden cage at the same time, without regret. Jacob was no good ever, and the overbearing nature of his parents had left a mark on the boy's life. He always wanted to prove himself strong, self-sufficient, and all-powerful, so he asserted himself as best he could. Veronica tried not to bend under him, but she was afraid for her life and the life of the child. Are you going to divorce him? John asked. Of course. Then what are you waiting for? You write a statement and I'll take you to court. You have a minor tom, so you'll have to go through this unpleasant procedure. Jack, the doctor who took you to the hospital, remember? He took all the beatings, wrote up a report that you needed surgery after your husband's games. So that's what we're taking to the police. Come on, John. He's gonna kill me. No, I'll just get a divorce. Then he'll really kill you and then he'll steal Tom. Why can't I have a husband like you? Kind, sensitive, child-loving, and Veronica looked at him with adoration. I'm far from white and fluffy and never have been. I can be rude, demanding, and even harmful. And if a person is a scoundrel like your husband or Mickey, I can always find the strength to tell them to their face. So don't idealize me. Everything I do for you and Tom is entirely of my own free will, and no one would make me do it against my will. I'm no noble knight. I'm as flawed as any man, but it's fair to say that I'd never allow myself to raise a hand against a woman or hurt a child. And you're a good mother, you have a maternal warmth that attracts Tom to you, and that's wonderful. You have a knight to think, either you change your life and we go to the court and the police, or you look for an apartment and shake from every knock waiting for the husband of a bandit. The next day was Saturday. John was not in a hurry, so breakfast was delayed. The first question he asked his guest was, of course, about her decision. What have you decided about your life? John, I was up all night. I've been thinking that if I wasn't so, how shall I put it? Don't tell me, I'll figure it out, he added with a smile. Oh, you're making it easy for me. If I wasn't like this, I could have avoided so many problems. I've made so many mistakes and every one of them is almost fatal. Don't scare me. Fatal means there's nothing you can do about it. I think you've got it all ahead of you. Your optimism is inspiring, but I'm scared to think what's ahead of me. You're gonna have a happy life without a tyrant. Do you have a good lawyer? No, I don't see any lawyers among my acquaintances. Well, that's easily remedied. Jack's doctor has a brother who's a very good lawyer, so we'll go to him. Oh my God, it was one mistake when I agreed to sign with him. I remember his every word, how he skillfully persuaded, insisted, but I held out for a year, pulled, said that a serious step, you need to think, but on the birthday of my son, 
he still talked me into it. He promised me a lot, as always, but I didn't need anything he tried to give me. I told him, remember, if you raise your hand against me, you're beating your son. He agreed and really, for six months or more, I was the happiest woman, but then my wishes were no longer taken into account. He reminded me that he was in charge and his wishes were the law. How he wants it to be is how it should be and everything else is dust. Jacob is king and God. It's become an unspoken law in our family. He's older, he's more experienced, so he'll decide everything. That's how my happiness ended. If I hadn't done that stupid thing, how easy things would be now. But we are not looking for easy ways. We need to get everything in the struggle, the sweeter the victory will be. Your gullibility is both bribing and infuriating at the same time. If you didn't know him, that's one thing, but he's already shown his hands in despotism and you still believe him. Yeah, I'm telling you I'm stupid. Remember in the difficult times, Veronica tried to realize what she had achieved by her 30th birthday. A despotic husband, a failed marriage, no job and no career, no home, no money, no nothing. So much for marital bliss. The only joy is a son. But that's a lot too. The woman reassured herself. Veronica, I love only you. Jacob tried to say softly. God, what a lie that was. Considering the constant humiliation and yelling. Do the women you love get beaten? Do the women you love get humiliated? No, no, and no. She no longer entertained the hope that her husband would ever be a better man and appreciate her. That's it. Hope was dead. Her illusions of marital happiness were gone like smoke. Veronica wanted to give him her life, but was left at a broken trough. Her marriage is a complete fiasco. Now it can be said for sure. Veronica didn't usually use profanity and had judged Diana when she used a three-story mat before she could close her mouth. But now she was so shattered by her outcome that she mentally allowed herself to lose control of herself. John wasted no time in calling Jack and asking about Liam. Valadia, we need your Liam now. I've been waiting for that call, because after Veronica's visit to my place and the way she'd been patched up, it was unforgivable. I'll tell Kier, he'll call you. But Jacob didn't waste any time. He called everyone he knew who knew Veronica in any way, but he couldn't get anywhere in his search. Only Diana had been to this house twice, and not just to this house. Now she was calling him, whispering into the phone that she missed him. She was looser and more experienced than Veronica, but she was sticky. Jacob didn't like that, so when he saw Diana calling, he didn't answer the phone. He didn't know who else to involve in the search for Veronica. It had been two weeks since she and her son had been away from home. The news came from nowhere. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Victor's Day, the head of the traffic safety department, began with another disappointing report, another traffic accident, and another fatality. On the table, there were reports on accidents and traffic violations committed by drivers and analysis of the reasons for their occurrence. I decided to start with the tapes, distracted by a phone call. Morning, Victor. He recognized his old friend Christian. He didn't like to talk to him, but he had to turn to him and he helped him. So, adjusting his voice to a friendly tone, he answered Jacob. I'll get right to the point, knowing how busy you are. Go ahead. My wife disappeared two weeks ago. Neighbors saw her leaving with a baby and a huge suitcase. Didn't leave town by any means of transportation, so maybe you can track her. Are you kidding me? How am I supposed to track her where, all over the city? He was pissed at everyone, even though he knew the guy was innocent. Why all over town? You know my address, look around the roads, see if you see anything interesting. All right, when did you say you disappeared? Two weeks ago? Yeah, you have a lot of traffic accidents there, two in the last two weeks. Yeah, I've heard that. Well, can you help? I can't promise anything, but if there's anything interesting, I'll call you. I still have your number. It's a pleasure, I'll be waiting. Veronica certainly didn't realize Jacob was getting too close. The two weeks Veronica and her son had been away from home, he'd been sick and twisted. He was angry at his wife, wanting to find her and punish her for everything she'd done, but on the other hand, he marveled at her courage. Mr. Christian had never thought he would long for his wife and son. The house was uncomfortable and cold without them. He feared that she had not just left him, but had gone to someone else. 
Could she have decided to do that? He was afraid to answer that question for himself. He was afraid that she would ask for a divorce, which of course he would not give her. Afraid to know the truth, where and with whom his Veronica was. But despite all the anger boiling in him, he had to admit to himself that he missed Veronica. He missed her as a woman. She hadn't broken, hadn't been afraid, and for that she was worth respecting, Jacob thought, angry at himself for thinking that. What was she missing? How dare she leave him with a child? He had no answers to those questions. Jacob had lived with this woman for almost seven years, and no matter what troubles happened between them, he had grown accustomed to her and loved her. He'd been unfaithful on occasion, and what man doesn't? But male adultery is quite different from female adultery. God made men that way, there's nothing you can do about it. His face was twisted with anger, and he didn't know what he would do to her if she were home right now. Yes, he wasn't the perfect husband, he'd hurt her, it was true, but why leave? And then in the collapse of relationships and families are always guilty of both. I saw his family and parental relationships in front of me. His father had always beaten his mother in front of little Jacob. He remembered how she used to wail when her husband chased her around the room. Don't, calm down. It was awful. He felt sorry for his mother and he stood up for her. But she wouldn't go anywhere and she wouldn't take him away from his father. And when his father died, his mother didn't cry, just stood there looking blank. The neighbors would tell her to cry. The mother looked at them and answered I cried all my tears when he beat me. There was nothing left. The women nodded understandingly and hugged her by the shoulders. Mother did not live long, but even the little that the Lord gave her, she walked with a smile and did not look back with fear. Those must have been the best years of her life. And his wife? What was she missing? A house full of trees, a beautiful son. You can't understand these women, Jacob thought, lying on the couch. He'd been neglecting his business a little, missing calls from his partners, Veronica on his mind. On Monday night, he got a persistent call from someone who didn't want to pick up the phone, but who wanted to talk to him. Yeah, he barked. Jacob? Well, who am I? To whom do I have the honor? I'm your wife's attorney, Veronica, representing her in divorce proceedings. My name is Liam. I prepare the divorce and property division papers. You'll need to review them, consult with your attorney, and give me an answer. The terms are more than good. Your spouse isn't out to rob you. Jacob jumped up from the couch. This was a well-known and very expensive lawyer. Where did my wife get the money to pay for your services? Is that all you're interested in? Don't you have any other questions? The lawyer asked in surprise. Where is my wife? I must talk to her first. I'm not authorized to give you her whereabouts. If she finds it necessary, she'll call you herself. Have a nice day. So she filed for divorce. She's offended, Jacob thought. He dialed her number, but nothing. She changed her says I am card. He threw the phone down angrily. Liam arrived Sunday night. John went out with Tom, and Veronica had a long talk with the lawyer. He was a man about 50 years old, gray-haired, with a very soft, ingratiating voice, which disposes to a frank conversation. In a couple of hours, she laid out to him all the reasons why she no longer wanted to see her husband. I hate him. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to live in the same house. I despise him as a man and I want nothing to do with him. Let him sign all the papers and give me a divorce. I'd like to part with him in a good way. Maybe you should think about it. You have a child, a boy. He needs a father. And if his father disgusts me, shouldn't the child see happy parents? He'll only learn to beat women and hate his father. I won't stop them seeing each other, but I won't live with him. You're a determined woman and you're tough on your husband. Every word you say is a sharp knife. If he heard you, he'd be hurt and offended, said Lion. Nothing, for his cheating and his abusive behavior, he deserves it. I lived with that monster for seven years. He's broken all my wings. I'm an unhappy woman, Veronica confessed to the lawyer and cried. Only my son was a ray of light in that dark kingdom. Only by looking at him could I live in his father's house. But recent events have put an end to our family relationship. The limit of my patience is over. I want a divorce and let him live as he wants and with whom he wants. He's always had a lot of women. He's never had enough of me. Liam looked at Veronica in her sad eyes and added, everything will be as you want it to be. Don't worry about it. 
Tuesday morning, he got a call from Victor Jacob. Come over. I have an interesting movie for you. I drove in with a whistle of tires. His tank took off. Jacob was in such a hurry that he was literally flying to meet Liam. He ran into the office, forgetting to say hello, and asked, Did you find her? You'll see for yourself. But the big suitcase and the little boy are present. That's her, said the man with the abnormally shiny eyes. You sit down and calm down. Otherwise, I won't show you anything. Take a sip of water. Jacob took a deep breath, drank some water, and really calmed down. Is that it? Are you okay? Yeah, sorry. Look, and he turned the display to him. Looking carefully at what was happening on the screen, he recognized Veronica at once, but when she fell, he even flinched. What's wrong with her? He asked the Liam. I don't know. Keep looking. The traffic resumed, and a young man got out of one car, lifted Veronica in his arms and carried her into the cabin, then took the suitcase, put it in the trunk, and put Tom in the back seat. He slammed the door shut and drove away. Jacob sat there, unable to say a word. Where was he taking her? Hospital, I think. There are two clinics along that road. You'll have no trouble finding out if she's there or not. Here's the license plate number of the rescuer. That's John. They own a company called Comtech, and this is his address. Look for your fugitive if she wants to come back to you. She's my wife, and she should live where her husband lives. I agree. Only she doesn't think so because she hasn't come back yet. Maybe she's in the hospital, unconscious, but she's got her papers on her. I think so. And the baby would have been returned to you. The police would have found you, I'm sure of it. Jacob was sad, but he didn't forget to say thank you. I owe you one. You want me to pay you back with money? No, I don't need money. If there's a problem, I'll come to you. It's a deal. He found the clinic where Veronica spent a week. They called the Dr. Jack. Hello, Jacob said, smiling sweetly. He obviously wanted the doctor to like him. Jack knew immediately who was in front of him. What can I do for you? You had Veronica here a while back. I know who you're talking about. Who are you? And what are you interested in? Jacob cheered up. The doctor was clearly in a good mood to talk to him. I'm Christiane's husband. I'm interested in what happened to her and where she is now. I don't know where she is now because I'm a doctor not a policeman. You'll tell me what happened to her now. Go ahead. I have nothing to tell you except that she ran away from me two weeks ago with the baby. That's it. Well, yes. What else did you want me to tell you? How many people raped her? Jacob looked startled at the doctor. What are you talking about? She had multiple lacerations. She was patched up, pieced together. All the beatings were removed. Every bruise was recorded and a doctor's report was written on the woman's condition after the surgery. I advised her to go to the police with these documents. I think they'll be interested in you. Any other questions for me? No. And the doctor left without saying goodbye. Mr. Christian didn't expect such a turn of events. When he left the clinic, he called his friend at the police station. Valera, it's me. Did they say you filed a report against me? Yes, yesterday. Why would you call me? You understand, I had it in my hands for two hours and they took it to the prosecutor's office. It's a very serious and competent document. The doctor's report is written to the letter. There's nothing to fault. Every bruise you gave her has been photographed. It's over, Jacob. What does that mean? It means you're looking at a very serious charge of spousal rape from eight and up. Do you have anyone in the DA's office? No, but even if I did, I wouldn't be asking for that kind of a charge. I suggest you make a deal with your wife. Kneel on your feet, apologize, and if she takes the complaint, you're lucky. He hung up without saying goodbye. Clearly, Veronica's got John's help. He can't forgive me for trying to ruin him. Okay, I'm not proud soothe himself a man can and lie on his feet, but the divorce will not give. With these thoughts, he went to John's address. Having called, he waited for the guard to open the gate, but the gate didn't open only a small intercom window. Who do you want? I'm looking for Veronica and my son Tom. We don't have those. This is John's house and he hasn't had visitors in years. My nerves were on edge. Open up, you thug, Jacob shouted, pounding his fist on the massive gate. But the guard didn't even bat an eye, just slammed the window shut. Veronica and Tom were gone. John had moved them into his one-room city apartment 
which had been empty since he moved out of town. That's what the lawyer said. It's wrong for you to hide it in your house. You could get in trouble. Move it to your apartment, and if they ask, say they're renting it. I'd even draw up a contract and put a price on it. You don't have to take the money, but it's the right thing to do. John did what Liam said. Jacob didn't want to leave John's house, where he thought his wife and baby were hidden. He waited until evening, but there was only one owner at the house. No one had come out of the house. Could they really not be here? Then where? Where should I go to look for them? I absolutely have to talk to Veronica. I'm sure I can convince her to take the application, Jacob thought as he drove up to the house. He'd been out of the office all day again, ignoring calls from work again. All his thoughts on his wife and child. All week he'd been driving to John's house but all to no avail. If I don't find him by Monday, I'll hire a private investigator. He had more experience and more time. Jacob partly understood his wife. He heard her. He'd raised his hand to her on more than one occasion. Veronica decided to get revenge, punish him for all his tears. She was trying to numb the pain that was tearing her up inside. He could certainly ask for forgiveness, even give himself and her his word, but he wasn't sure if he could change his behavior. This is the way he's used to living. This is how his father lived. This is how the neighbors lived. He did not say it was right, but seeing it from childhood, he could not change himself. After the birth, his wife blossomed. She became seductive. All the men who came to visit him looked at her, but she got her way. He was driving along the central street of the city and thought, thought about how to fix the situation. Standing under a traffic light, he looked around and saw his Veronica his son in the company of John. How to get out of the car, he didn't know. There was a huge tail behind him and everyone was honking. He rounded the corner and jumped out of the car. He tried not to lose sight of them. When he saw the two of them, he felt a lump in his throat. The fuses blew all at once and it was impossible to contain himself. They looked like family. Not a single thought in his head, only rage, anger, and spite, which were bad counselors. He couldn't feel his own body, it was as if it had atrophied. Pulling himself together, he ran across the road and followed them into the mall. He didn't find them right away. They were sitting in a cafe drinking coffee. Tom was having a brownie. Hello, son. Daddy shouted the child and ran to him and his arms spread apart. Veronica immediately stood up. She was afraid he would carry him away. But Jacob wasn't going to make her angry on the contrary. He wanted to show with all his behavior that he wouldn't do anything bad. Hello, Veronica. I've been looking for you. I missed you so much. We need to talk. I'm not going anywhere with you. All right, let's sit here at the table and talk. John didn't interfere as long as Jacob was behaving appropriately. He knew they had to talk anyway. Veronica, you two talk here, and Tom and I will go to the game room. Okay, just not for long. During those two weeks, her husband had become a complete stranger to her. She didn't even want to look at him. How are you feeling? Jacob asked with concern. You make it sound like you're mocking me. Veronica, I'm sorry. I was out of line, but to be honest, I don't remember much from that night. That doesn't excuse you, and I'm not going to forgive you. I almost died after your games. I can't see you. Jacob could barely contain himself. He'd never let anyone talk to him like that. Men were afraid of him. Girls looked up to him with adoration and his wife couldn't find the words. I filed for divorce. This time it's serious, and I'm not backing down. How are you going to live? Is this the one you're hoping for? And he nodded at John. I've never relied on anyone, just myself. If you remember, I was working and making a good living. I'll go back to the fashion house and Tom will go to daycare like all the other kids. We'll manage. You shouldn't do that, Veronica. I love you. That's a strange kind of love you got there, Jacob. You beat me, you rape me. You don't let me out of the house. You don't let me talk to my girlfriends. You don't let me work. You don't confuse the two. Is that what you call love? Love is different. No one said it would be easy to live with me. It's easy to love when things are good. You try to keep your feelings alive when things are a mess. Forgiveness is hard, but if you want to keep your family together. She didn't let him finish. I don't want to, not at all. When I think of your fists, my whole body hurts. I've heard a lot that the key to family happiness is to accept a man as he is, not trying to subjugate him to suit your whims. 
That's hard, but you've never been able to do it, and more importantly, you've never wanted to. So let's end this conversation. You're going to work this out with my lawyer. Do you want money for a lawyer? No. I can handle it on my own. That John promised to help. John saved me from dying. No one stopped for a car. He came out and helped me. So you should be thanking him, not bankrupting his firm. What did you complain about? No, I was just comparing the facts. Well, if you've made up your mind and I can't seem to talk you into it, then I have a condition. I'll give you a divorce and agree to everything your lawyer tells me if you drop the police report. And if I don't, then this divorce case will drag on for years. It won't drag on for years. You'll go to jail and I'll divorce you without your consent. Understand? She was about to get up to leave when he tucked her arm roughly, pulling her back into the chair. You will do as I tell you. I can't believe you're gonna let a kid have a black spot on his record. I mean, any decent organization is gonna have to show the father and mother. You don't care how your son is viewed. I don't think he'll thank you for it. Veronica thought for a moment. I'll go to the child and think about your proposal in peace. How do I get in touch with you? Your lawyer will contact you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Veronica. I'm not so easy to get rid of. Oh, I don't need to be reminded of that. And she ran to the second floor to find Tom and John. Where's daddy? The child asked when he saw only mommy. He went to work. When are we going home? Veronica looked at John for support, but he preferred not to interfere in family matters. You'll have to decide that for yourselves, John replied to her pleading look. Do you miss daddy? Yes. Veronica didn't know what the right thing to do was, so she called Liam. I wanted to consult with you. Don't do it over the phone. I'll come over. Okay. After her meeting with Jacob, Veronica began to have thoughts. She kept coming back to the life she led with her almost ex-husband. And the more she thought about it, the more panic overwhelmed her. What would her son say to her when he grew up? Why did you deprive me of my father? What would she say to him? Tell them how he beat her or worse, raped her. She would start pacing the apartment, rubbing her temples with trembling hands. The child misses her father. Does she have the right to put him away for a long time, a very long time, and Tom? Will he ask her again when they go home to daddy? Everything had been so easy before this meeting, and after talking to Jacob, there were more questions. Her insides twisted at the thought of Jacob's satisfied face and the smug look he'd thrown at his rebellious wife. But she could handle it, because she wasn't alone. The main thing was that she'd had the strength to leave, or she'd have lost herself. Anything can happen in life, you can lose everything in a moment, but losing yourself is the worst. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I'm stuffed up. I don't see my happiness, a spoiled girl to her rich husband, but how scary it is to have everything and not feel happy. She was ready to give the appearance of this happiness for a small apartment, the opportunity to work and be near her son, or maybe to hell with those thoughts. She tried to push them away, tired of them. Glancing at her watch, Veronica waited for the lawyer. The doorbell rang only two hours later. Sorry, Veronica, I'm late. Traffic was terrible. Well, thank you for coming. I've been waiting for you. Now I can't take a step without your advice. Calm down and tell me. He realized from her frightened eyes that Jacob had found her and was probably intimidating her. How did he find you? How did you know? I guess from your condition. I don't know. We were with Tom and John at the mall and he came up. He was trying to be very nice and peaceful, but I saw something in his eyes that others didn't. He was staring at me from the corner of his eye, like a beast. Anger, hatred, rage, those feelings that sizzle him. He said to take the statement from the police and then he'd agree to all our terms, and if I didn't, he'd make the divorce last for years. He's bluffing. If you don't take the statement, he'll get time served and you'll divorce him quietly. That's what I told him, but he frightened me that it would be a black mark on Tom's record. His father's an ex-con, and he might not get a good job. And then Tom threw himself into his arms, and now he's asking me when we're going home to dad. So I'm confused. What do I do, Lyme? Whatever we decide to do is what we do. Don't take anything. You burn your bridges. You don't want to go back. You of all people know this man. If you show him you have any doubts or worse fear, he'll never let you live. That's not what I'm worried about. In court, there may be a question of how you're going to provide for the child. You don't have a job. 
you don't have a place to live. Those are all arguments against you. So only the father can bring him up. He's got great facilities, Mike. It turns out he's an eligible groom, mansion, business, good looks. It's all in his favor. The court can give him a reprieve. What am I supposed to do? Get a job right away. Put Tom in daycare. The apartment will be rented for now, but it's available. Otherwise, there will be problems. If the kindergarten is a problem, I'll help you. Okay, I'll call work tomorrow. I think it won't be a problem. He was tired today. He had one more difficult case to finish, but it was a lot of sweat. That's why Liam felt like he'd been drained. You're tired, Liam. Why don't I buy you some borscht? Tom praised me today. Did he? Well, then I'm in. The lawyer left an hour later, leaving Veronica to ponder. In the morning, she called the fashion house, but unfortunately, they were short-staffed and turned her down. It was a blow. She couldn't believe that there was no room for her where she had worked for several years. It was morning on the clock, and she no longer had any energy. It was as if she was being forced to unload rail cars. The fact that she wasn't being hired ruined her already bad mood. She called the model home again. It's me again. I'm sorry to interrupt you from work. Maybe you know who meets clothes demonstrators. Veronica, I really don't. You're a good worker. I'm sorry to turn you down. But I can't just fire someone for your past performance. You took a long time to get ready. I'm sorry. And she hung up. Veronica cried and covering her eyes with her palms, collapsed on the couch. She felt cornered. Nothing was working out for her. It was painful, hurtful, and she thought, unfair. And what are you so snotty about? The inner voice said. Is this a time to feel sorry for yourself? You're a fashion designer. Pull yourself together. Get your laptop and look, look, looked. She jumped up. Tom was standing beside her, and he was sniffling too. Mommy, why are you crying so loud? Are you scared? I'm sorry, sweetie. I just remembered something sad. She wiped her tears, titting her hair as if someone could see her and open her laptop. Despite her hysterics, despite her resentment that she couldn't do anything, after sitting at the laptop for two hours, she found a job opening at a sewing factory and called immediately. Yes, we need a fashion designer designer. Do you have any experience? Veronica had nothing to say. I graduated from college as a fashion designer. I have my own work experience. How many years ago? Maybe I'd better come. I see. No experience. You graduated from college about 10 years ago. She didn't specify how long, because the woman was right. She's got nothing. No career, no family. Young lady, are you still here? The woman on the other end of the line asked. Yes. Come by tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Bring your work. See you tomorrow. She didn't hope for anything. Even on a penny like that, the administration wanted someone with experience. In the morning, having collected Tom, at 9 o'clock sharp, they stood at the gatehouse. A pass was issued in Veronica's name and she entered the factory. The woman with whom she had spoken yesterday turned out to be a petite brunette, very pleasant looking. Who's that mommy's ponytail? She said to the child. I'm not a ponytail, I'm Tom. Will you go to work with him too? The woman asked sternly. No, no, no. The kindergarten is quarantined for the time being, but soon it will be open for children. Well, let's see your work and you want to talk to the head of the experimental shop. It's our main department. It is there that new models of future clothes are developed. There we have modelers, designers, technologists who make samples of models. Finish her story, Megan. That was the name of this sociable woman. She opened a large folder with models and looked at Veronica. The patterns are old. We made them five years ago. Do you have any newer ideas? I have ideas. I just haven't had time to realize them. Veronica said in a high-pitched voice. Megan took her to the shop manager. Edward, here Veronica is the new girl. I told you about her yesterday. Will you talk to her? Yes, I would like to. In front of her stood a young man blonde with blue eyes and a dimple on his chin. He was a little taller than Veronica. Come in, he invited her, letting her into the office. They talked for about half an hour and the boss agreed to take her on a one-month probationary period. Our team is young, not afraid to put forward bold ideas, so we keep up with the times. I will be glad if you will settle in and will be useful to our factory. I'll do my best. Tomorrow to the personnel department and get to work. 
Veronica had been working at the factory for a month. She didn't like the work. It wasn't her job to design models, but she was good at it. Tom went to a private kindergarten a stone's throw from home. She rarely saw John, mostly on phone calls. Several times she'd been called in to speak to an investigator and Liam had accompanied his client. He was so experienced, never let his client no offense. The investigators sometimes got lost talking to her. A month later, Veronica got a call from Manuel. Veronica, have you found a job? Yes, I work as a fashion designer. And why these questions? Will you come back to us? Diana got fired. She showed up drunk at a fashion show a week ago. We didn't see her. She fell down on the runway. It was a scandal. And yours was in the front row, watching. Are they with Diana? You didn't know? No, but I don't care. We're getting divorced. So you're coming. I'm afraid to quit. What if you forgive her and I have to leave? And no one will hire me here. No, don't worry. The director won't take her back. She's not a bad girl, but she's got no breaks. We're expecting you tomorrow. The feeling was twofold. On the one hand, she was glad that she was going to do what she liked. But on the other hand, she was uncomfortable in front of Edward because she had just started working and Jacob would be after her again. But Veronica wanted to go back to her old job. She felt she belonged here and her earnings allowed her to live without counting pennies. Well, we have no right to keep you. I can only wish you all the best, said the foreman and they said goodbye. In the morning, Veronica was in a great mood. Now everything will get better, thought the woman. They were in a hurry with their son to work. He to kindergarten and she to the fashion house. Sitting in the bus and watching what was happening outside the window, she smiled. She was distracted from her pleasant thoughts by a phone call. It was John. Good morning. Hi, I'm on my way to work at the fashion house. Can you believe it? Diane got fired for misconduct. She heard John laughing. Why are you laughing? That's what you get fired for. She came to work drunk, Veronica said in a whisper. Did you think carefully before you agreed? You mean Jacob? That's right. I thought about it. What am I supposed to do now? Hide. Go to a job I don't like? Is that what you're suggesting? I'm suggesting that you think carefully before you do anything. You're responsible for the baby, and he hummed up. John shouted Veronica, apparently so loudly that the passengers looked back at her. She got there quickly. With a sinking heart, Veronica opened the familiar door and walked into the lobby, where she was enveloped by such a familiar smell. The guards greeted her and smiled, so they hadn't forgotten. The girls hugged her and tried to touch her. Veronica looks away embarrassed, clutching her bag. She's in her element. As she approached the principal's office, she bumped into Diana. She was in tears and looked at Veronica like an enemy of the people. You waited? If I hadn't snapped, you wouldn't be here. Quiet, quiet, but you're a mean one. Jacob raised you right. You put a man like that in jail. She sniffled and walked away. What did she just say? The kind of man Jacob put away, the kind of man he took into custody, and she died of a lawyer. Liam, what about Jacob? What about him? He's in lockup where he belongs. If you're going to withdraw your statement, you can find another lawyer right away. I don't work with kamikazes. No, 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 no. No, I just found that out by accident. That's why I called you to check. I'm working at the fashion house again as of today. I was afraid Jacob would come after me. Don't worry, you can work in peace. Even though he knew someone in the prosecutor's office, they couldn't help him. But your Jacob tried very hard. He's not mine and he'll never be mine again. I like your attitude. After talking to the lawyer, I was in a life is good and living is good mood. There was peace inside. Now she could live her life without looking back. Great. Her life began to change the minute she was free of Jacob. This was the relief she had dreamed of all six years. Jacob was no longer her problem. Finally, she walked into the principal's office. Nothing had changed here, except that Elizabeth had gotten a little chin over the years, but she was still dressed smartly and tastefully. Veronica walked forward a little, eyeing Elizabeth. Her pink lips stretched into a smile, clearly pleased to see Veronica here again. Are you happy? She started the first conversation. You're in great shape, as always, she said, looking her over from head to toe. Yes, I'm happy to be back at home. Shall we sign the contract? Are you ready? I'm ready. 
She went to a few more interviews, had to see Jacob. But with a lawyer by her side, she felt very confident. At the trial, Mr. Christian behaved abominably. He kept trying to accuse Veronica of cheating on him. She's even living in his apartment now, even though she's still my wife. Your honored counselor, she rents this apartment. Here's the lease, here are the receipts. But this is John's apartment. But she has the right to rent any apartment, especially since this one is cheaper. She lived in his house while I was looking for her all over the city shouted at the hall X. She wasn't just living, she was between life and death, beaten and raped. As soon as she got better, Veronica left and has been living on her own for a long time. After being beaten for all of six plus years, it's a wonder she didn't become disabled finished the lawyer. Jacob and Christian had two attorneys and they earned their bread honestly. The trial was postponed three times at the request of the accused and they even managed to reduce the sentence by three years. The sentence was read for about an hour and Mr. Christian received nine years in a strict regime colony. She breathed the air of freedom and her heart missed John. But that's another story.